to go. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. The meeting of the Arizona Board of Regents was called to order Wednesday evening before we convene an executive session. Today's public meeting is scheduled until 530. A link to the live stream of the public meeting is available on the board's website under ABOR Live. A paragraph which always I find interesting because if you're not already online, that doesn't do you much good. But, um, or by going to YouTube and searching under ABOR News. Let's begin with our pledge. Regent Zaragoza, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge allegiance to the, to the flag of the United States, United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> ah, thank you, Regent. <clears throat> Let me uh, begin missing and greatly missed. Uh, at today's meeting is Regent Herbold. Um, everyone is aware that Regent Herbold resigned uh, just last week due to uh, health issues, and I know he's very sad about that, but we obviously wish him a very, very speedy recovery, and we know that it's not lost uh, that what an exceptional impact he made on us in a very brief amount of time. In a couple of years, it was evident that he epitomized the very best of public service, uh, character, integrity, really visionary leadership. I think most of us read his books. Um, his, he was unique, his expertise in business, finance, <clears throat> strategic operations, and having served on a variety of other higher education board, boards around the country was of really great benefit to us. And um, I know he's became a trusted friend and mentor for many of us, and he will be missed. I know that he is paying attention and is, will be available, but just wanted him to know at the outset that uh, he's left a mark and a legacy, and, and we will miss him. <coughs> Excuse me, President Crow, thank you for hosting our board meeting today. We're looking forward to the presentation on the state of the university, as we always do. It's a really exciting time for us. Um, and in case anyone has missed the message, uh, ASU has ranked number one in innovation now for nine years running. Extraordinary story. Yeah. <laughs> but this, this week, this week, ASU claimed another big ranking breaking into the top 10, number nine, among the world's top universities for U.S. utility patents issued in 2023, which underscores the university's unwavering commitment to fueling America's innovation ecosystem and translating cutting-edge research into practical solutions. Um, this uh, is a list released by the National Academy of Inventors, and, you know, it, it's good company, MIT, Stanford, Harvard, uh, so pretty fantastic. Um, and while we are here today at the ASU Tempe campus, um, I want to just address a thing or two regarding the University of Arizona. I know we're eager to uh, constantly be engaging in the financial turnaround that is occurring uh, in Tucson. But uh, I want to start by saying I know everyone has heard the news of the University of Arizona's selection of their new athletic director, which the, vote, uh, the board will vote on today. Desiree Reed Francois is an amazingly fantastic selection to chart the course for the future of the University of Arizona's athletic program. Her pending appointment signals a decisive stride forward towards reshaping and modernizing our athletic endeavors uh, into a destination covenanted by athletes and cherished by fans alike. And let me be clear, uh, she is selected in large part because she has a crucial responsibility to help shepherd athletics into a uh, physically responsible budget unit of the overall university. She has shown in her past jobs in Missouri and at UNLV the ability to do this. She has the leadership talent and vision to support the ongoing financial turnaround of the university. And uh, I was particularly pleased in her press conference when she articulated two things. One is her deep personal connection to Tucson based upon her own experience as a law grad there and some personal things that happened while she was there. And second, her comment coming from a big five school and uh, you know, making the move to the University of Arizona saying this is a school who, whose athletic program is on the rise. And that's, I think, a metaphor for what is happening with the University of Arizona writ large. We are going to go through a little bit of a rough patch here, and but we are ultimately going to be back on the rise, and we are doing that uh, with this appointment uh, in the athletics department. Um, we also have a contract uh, for the extension of men's basketball coach Tommy Lloyd which honors his leadership and success in basketball, now ranked four and probably, I guess, this week may go a little higher. Uh, so exciting times in basketball. He, too, uh, will be counted upon uh, under the leadership of the new athletic director as we continue to modernize the athletic programs. 
I also want to give a particular shout out to uh, the president and to the donors who in a remarkably short amount of time uh, in their excitement for these hires and for the future of the U of A athletics program have uh, contributed quickly millions of dollars uh, to make sure that the university uh, had the resources it needs to uh, uh, make this move forward. So to those donors, a very, very public thank you. <coughs> this week, the board also submitted to Governor Hobbs a report that details the rationale and process used to assess the purchase of the University of Arizona Global Campus. And you can, re you can access this report on the board's website. Previously, we had submitted a report on the financial turnaround plan to Governor Hobbs, which is also on the ABOR website. We are moving forward with speed, purpose, uh, to chart the right path forward for the University of Arizona. Uh, graphic number one. And the graphic on the screen shows the six guiding principles in our turnaround plan, and we, we stand behind each one of these. They are principles that came from the campus. We're uh, doing our, our best to, to really listen to campus constituents and campus reaction, uh, met with students, met with many faculty, and from that, I, I call these the red lines. And certainly number one is the most important. Um, let's be clear about the math. The, the reality of the math that we face is quite simple. There are two choices. You can cut costs or you can raise tuition. That's it. That's it. If you're not going to do one, you're forced to do the other. This is a math equation. Uh, so that is number one on this list, but we will honor each of these principles as we go forward. We are not going to uh, impact current students. We are not going to touch retirement or benefits. We are not going to implement furloughs. We are going to cut first from the top, as the campus is urging us to do, and we are going to protect the academic core, the mission, and the long-term strength and vision of the University of Arizona. So we have a plan, and we are executing on it. The $27 million in administrative reductions was the first step. A major issue has been the athletics department. With the announcement of the new athletic director, we feel like we have the right leadership in place at the right time to get athletics in the right spot. The centralization of IT, HR, and finance is already underway. So we're making progress and executing according to plan. More to come, but real steps are being taken. And we're eager to work with everyone and anyone who is interested in contributing to real solutions and discussing these real choices. Now, before going on to um, the agenda uh, that we have before us, I'd like to, to add a personal statement about um, something personal and something unfortunate that occurred at the University of Arizona Faculty Senate meeting this last Monday afternoon. An accusation was made by the faculty chair that I had a conflict of interest relative to a former client and this board. Let me simply state some facts that are readily researchable and in the public domain. Before I joined this board, I had a client called Amicus that was in the business of public-private financing partnerships for universities. Frankly, it failed to land any business. It generated no income. It went out of business in August 2017. I returned to this board a year after that association. Even if Amicus had pursued or landed business in Arizona, which we didn't, it would have been impossible to have had a conflict because the two engagements never overlapped. This is obvious from a rudimentary search of corporate filings or even my social media bio page. The caliber of academic research skills that were demonstrated here are rather concerning. I frankly now doubt the accuracy and credibility of any one of the many accusations that are being made against the university and the president. And unfortunately, Dr. Hudson has inflicted a terrible blow to shared governance, which frankly works so well at the other two universities. How do you develop trust with people who intentionally lie about and publicly defame their partner? It's shameful. The U of A faculty has deep, important, legitimate concerns. I've been in touch literally with dozens of them in order to gain good quality faculty input. In the last meeting, I gave my email. I'll do it again. Fred.Duval at azregents.edu. I will respond to every call. I'll respond to every email. I have had dozens and dozens 
I take it seriously. I will take input from anyone who wants to reach out to me. And I haven't wanted these particular issues to become a public squabble, but frankly, I must personally say this crossed a line. I refuse to be a punching bag or let intentional def defamation go unanswered. I have retained former U.S. Attorney Paul Charlton as legal counsel, and I will pursue legal remedies. And faculty Senate members have received a demand to preserve all documents on this topic that will support my remedies and my need to get my reputation fully back. So with that, our first item is called to the audience. Yes, Bridget Manson. I'd like to make a statement as well. Um, many of you know I, I spoke regarding the U of A faculty about a year ago. And I think it's important that we continue that conversation. The behavior of the U of A faculty senate has been of, of concern to the regents for a number of years. And this past week's devolution into personal attacks is beyond the pale. It is fully indicative of the culture of fear that has been instilled by the current leadership, creating an environment where faculty are loath to speak their minds in opposition or even contemplate running against the current regime because the retribution from leadership is swift and personal. At some point, enough needs to be enough. And that time is now. We're frankly unsure of how representative this body is of the greater faculty at U of A. With few exceptions, productive and positive-minded faculty have declined to serve in the Senate because of its negative and aggressive nature and its lack of focus on what is truly best for the university. Most view it as a monumental waste of time and energy. Watching this Senate try to run a meeting is an exercise in futility. It is embarrassing the level of dysfunction on display and the lack of any productive recommendations or outcomes. Members of this Senate have openly expressed their goal to run the university and have actively worked to destabilize the administration. The phrase shared governance implies some sort of willingness to actually engage constructively in partnership with others. This body is and has been overtly confrontational and anti-administration with an eye toward the expansion of their authority well outside the intention or norms of shared governance. We encourage President Robbins to establish new faculty leadership and to seek out faculty who are interested in contributing to real solutions rather than posturing and undermining potential progress. Thank you. Our first item is call to the audience. If you have any materials for the regents, please give them to our board secretary, Suzanne Templin, who is sitting at the table over here to my right, and she will distribute them to the regents. Pursuant to board policy, time has been set aside for a call to the audience, and the board reserves the right to limit the number of presenters on any one topic. As a public board, we want to hear your stories. We want to hear your opinions. The call to the audience is not a place for threatening comments, it is an opportunity for individuals to address the entire board in a public setting to express their views or concerns regarding matters of board governance. Regents do not typically respond to comments made during call to the audience. However, we do hear your remarks and we may ask the appropriate person to follow up and provide us with information on any issues that are raised. When you're called to speak, please proceed to the lectern. Keep us on schedule. Each speaker has no more than three minutes. As a courtesy to each speaker, Suzanne will hold up a sign sitting up here, signaling how much time the speaker left, uh, has left remaining. At the end of your three minutes, we ask that you please conclude your remarks to give other people a chance to speak. I will gently, at some point uh, after three minutes, uh, enforce the time limits. But I do want to make sure that everyone gets heard. Uh, this is out of respect for everyone. University staff is here to ensure that this meeting remains safe and no one here at this table or among the audience is at any kind of personal risk of harm. With that, Suzanne, would you please call out our first member of the audience to the lectern? Thank there you, Chair Duvall. Our first uh, speaker is Hypatia Marviglia, followed by Michael Kentscher.
Hi. But this is not on. Oh, microphone. Who's got control? <coughs> there we go. All right. I'm Hypatia Medivia. I'm a grad student at ASU. I am the uh, student representative for UC Dub at, AC, at ASU. While y'all were misplacing $240 million, the workers who actually keep your universities operating are struggling to afford basic medical care. I am a graduate student worker here at ASU. Our student insurance package, UHSR, does not cover vision. It does not cover dental. For workers with dependents, it does not cover their essential health care. My international friends are actually required by your contract with UHSR to take this half-ass insurance plan and barred from using an equivalent or better plan. UHSR has refused to cover my friend's life-changing medication that they've taken for years, even refusing their doctor's recommendations. Furthermore, UHSR's requirements for gender-affirming care fundamentally misunderstands the medical basics of living while trans, demanding prerequisites that are not universal for all trans people. In our grad stipends, if UHSR refuses to cover care, it is simply means that that care will not happen. I can, I can see you, right? You know, do you need cocoa melon on the side? Like, look at me when I'm speaking to you. UHSR is yet another example of ABOR throwing the well-being of its students into the grinder. We demand comprehensive health insurance instead of the scraps y'all throw us now. Don't need teeth if you can't afford food. Ain't that right? Michael Kencher, followed by Matthew Duma. Hello. HB 2178 is a disaster. It's written by people who know nothing about how our universities operate, and it will destroy student organizations and the vibrant campus community they create. I've been at ASU as a student for nine years now through three degree programs. I've joined multiple student orgs. I've helped found two. I've advised others, and I've served in leadership positions across the majority of that time. I'm a proud queer student leader and queer activist who has spent nearly the past decade embedded in our student community on this campus and the organizations that help it thrive. I know how, I know firsthand just how important our student organizations are and how horribly destructive HB 2178 will be to them. There are over a thousand student orgs at ASU alone. Imagine being a new student who's sitting down, filling out a bunch of paperwork, and now you're faced with a wall of a thousand checkboxes to go through and check individually which organizations are going to receive your student dollars. It's absurd. No one does that. No one goes past the first search page on Google. No one's going to go past all of these different pages and organizations to th carefully think about what organizations are going to actually receive their money. This means organizations of well-known national names and wealthy out-of-state interest donors are going to be the only ones that survive because HB 2178 includes a carve-out specifically for private donations. This will allow out-of-state interests into our university campuses. The students that are marginalized the most are black, indigenous, Hispanic, and queer students, as well as our neuro neurodivergent and community of people with disabilities will be the most harmed by this bill. These student organizations will not receive funding because incoming students will have no idea what these organizations do by name alone. We already have a system in place that makes much more sense for this, that's much easier, that's much simpler, that's much cheaper, that's much more equitable. All of our students pay into a centralized fund that is managed by our elected student leaders, and any organization that wants can request funds from this to run their activities. HB 2178 would eliminate that system. It's no secret that the Arizona Board of Regents has lost a lot of our trust. I noticed, however, that on the record, the board opposes this bill. Vocally opposing this bill is one small and easy step that the board can take to help regain the trust of the community that they serve. Let's keep our campus communities bright and alive. Let's support the future leaders of Arizona by resoundingly saying no to the Defund Student Activities Act, also known as HB 2178. Thank you. Matthew Duma, followed by Alexis Blasco.
Hello, everyone. My name is Matthew. I'm a part of Socialist Revolution and a member of the United Campus Workers Union here at ASU. I stand here today in protest of the Arizona Board of Regents' attempt at stopping funding of politically affiliated groups on campus through the passage of the House Bill 2178. This is unjust. And it's clear that the only organizations that currently receive support outside of the university are those with wealthy donors and subsidies from politicians, while groups like us, Socialist Revolution, along with groups like YDSA, SJP, and other groups against the status quo get nothing to voice our opinions aside from our own hard work. This is against the very premise of free speech, and the perpetuation of this is nothing short of a testament to ASU's cowardice in regards to standing up for what is right. They know what they are doing, and they know that if we just let this pass, our voices will be snuffed out. Students aren't attending a university to be taught dogmas and commandments. They are here to learn to think and to form their own ideas. If this bill passes, the education of students as a whole is at risk. These organizations do have political stance, yes, but more importantly, they stand to keep us as functioning, educated, and self-thinking individuals in our society. So we can't let that happen. We have to work together and fight back against this injustice to keep our voices loud and an unapologetic support for the oppressed and to continue to rage against the oppressors. As such, I ask all of you who are truly for freedom of speech, those who believe that the constitutional right to our expression and education is a truly beautiful value in this country, I ask that all of you to stop this injustice and vote against the passage of this bill. Thank you. Alexis Blasco, followed by Bryce Askew. Hello, and thank you for having me today. My name is Alexis Blasco, and I serve as the ASU West Valley Undergraduate Student Body President and trustee to ASU's Board of Trustees. Today, I speak for Undergraduate Student Government at West Valley. I recognize ABOR's stance on House Bill 2178, but I would like to take time today to make very clear the impacts and implications the bill has on our student governments. ASASU, including West Valley, is funded by our student-initiated fee, all immersion students, alongside our expanding online co counterparts, contribute to covering this fee. All ASASU organizations exclusively fund events and initiatives that are held on ASU's campuses and are open, free, and accessible to all students per our Constitution and bylaws. And HB 2178 would radically change the functions of student governments in limiting their ability to foster widespread change. Our fee considers factors such as safety, inclusion, and fulfillment of the university and, missions, and organization's mission statements, and terrorist organizations and organizations, that, and, and organizations and events that discriminate are not eligible for funding. However, unlike our process, HB 2178 diminishes student choice. By overlooking the fact that not every student may actively engage with clubs and organizations or participate in voting on funding allocations, it creates a distortive scenario where certain groups, whether larger or associated with privately funded entities, could wield disproportionate influence over the results of a, pun, a, a, of a public funding election, skewing the true voice of the student body. This risks turning a supposed democratic process into a system susceptible to the dominance of specific groups which will ultimately hinder the fair representation of diverse student perspectives and needs. What proclaims to include some students, in reality, acts to exclude others, prompting us to question who does and doesn't belong in higher education. 2178 not only complicates the equitability of the funding review process, but challenges the fundamental goal of collegiate education. The bill's provisions stand in stark contrast to ASU's charter, and this misalignment weakens academia's core purpose of fostering the introduction of new ideas to propel human achievement forward, which consequently hinders the progress of our communities at large. Ultimately, the effects are twofold. 2178 contradicts ASU's commitment to inclusivity while also jeopardizing the vibrant and diverse ecosystem that contributes to the holistic development of students. The richness of a university environment stems from the variety of clubs and organizations that cater to the diverse interests and identities of students. ASU boasts over 1,000 clubs and orgs, each contributing uniquely to the campus fabric. If funding becomes contingent on a popular vote, we are neglecting smaller or niche organizations and students that play a crucial role in the diverse tapestry of campus life. Furthermore, larger clubs with their higher marketing potential can reach students more quickly, hindering smaller clubs from expanding their ideas and unique interests. This especially affects new students who are not aware of the diverse selection of clubs. This policy inadvertently fosters competition among clubs that have unrelated missions, objectives, and goals. USG West Valley opposes HB 2178 and urges our legislative partners to seek solutions that promote fair access to higher ed and cultivate diverse and vibrant communities. Thank you.
Bryce Askew, followed by Evan Berry. Hello, my name is Bryce and I'm a current student at Arizona State University and I'm uh, involved in uh, several student organizations including the Young Democratic Socialists of America at ASU. I have come here to stand in solidarity with my fellow students and student organizations that have said loudly with one voice we must reject HB 2178. This bill is a thinly veiled attack on pro-Palestinian advocacy but more broadly is an attack on student organizations, freedom of speech, and freedom of expression. By allowing students to handpick what organizations get their funds, the legislature is enabling funding discrimination and encouraging the dismemberment of student organizations that represent marginalized groups and do not have larger organizations, national organizations, bankrolling their activities. This is while the university and ABOR has done nothing to punish organizations like Turning Point USA, which assaulted a queer professor on campus, while it has suspended a prominent pro-Palestinian organization, Metro de ASU, for condemning genocide and standing against ASU's complicity in this genocide. By remaining silent on HB 2178, ABOR and the ASU administration are endorsing suppression of freedom of speech and confirming that they do not value political expression on campus. We demand that ABOR use all of its political resources to put pressure on the legislature to stop playing with student organizations and academic freedom. We further demand that ASU and ABOR stop suppressing pro-Palestinian speech and engage honestly and equitably with the union, United Campus Workers, to ensure a more equitable and fair campus environment. ABOR and the legislature must listen to students rather than try to suppress them. And further, we demand that ASU listen to the demands of groups like Students Against Apartheid and Students for Justice in Palestine, which demand transparency in ASU's investments and demand divestment from companies complicit in the genocide of Palestinians by the Israeli occupation forces. We recognize that ABOR and ASU have stood on the side of the oppressor rather than the oppressed and would like to demand these groups, remind these groups that their students will not stand silently as they support genocide. We're demanding our, our campus to stand against complicity with genocide, apartheid, occupation, and companies who, respect, who refuse to respect workers' rights and demands. Will you commit to a condemnation of companies that, com that engage in union busting and, and support occupation, apartheid, and genocide? Free Palestine. Evan Barry, followed by Richard Neuhauser. My name is Evan Berry. I'm a member of the Faculty of Religious Studies here on the ASU's Tempe campus. I'm grateful to have an opportunity to speak with you this afternoon about uh, my opposition to proposed House Bill 2735. This proposed legislation is a serious threat to academic freedom and will have a chilling effect on the tenor of free speech on this and the other Arizona public university campuses. Uh, it's shocking to me that there is a national conversation going on about censorship in higher education that the Arizona legislature would at this time propose a bill that would make it more difficult for scholars to pursue free and independent inquiry. No one supporting this bill should be able to say they are defending uh, free speech on college campuses. Related to, but distinct from, free speech is the value of academic freedom. Academic freedom involves processes where knowledge can be pursued within rigorous, specialized systems and institutions. The inclusion of faculty in the governance of what kinds of curricular programs and lines of research are happening on our campuses is important because scholars are trained to assess the quality and value of the knowledge in those rigorous specialized ways. Removing faculty governance, given the, that this session began with an invocation of the importance of shared governance, removing faculty from university governance will weaken our academic freedom at Arizona's public universities and by extension, weaken their ability to offer a world-class education that benefits students in the state and beyond. Arizona State University in particular has grown and thrived over the, the past two decades for precisely these reasons. I would also like to speak to the specific concerns I'm hearing from my colleagues in the humanities, who know all too well what kinds of uh, programs are usually first for consideration when budget cuts are made by appointed, unelected officials. Uh, when institutions of higher learning are thriving, they include a great many different types of programs and fields of study, which together in concert work are, are critical to the work of the public university in preparing younger generations for civic engagement, as well as economic opportunity and resilience. By consolidating who has authority over the most fundamental aspects of our university's governance, 
HB 2735 would jeopardize this work and weaken our ability to fulfill the missions of our universities. I join my colleagues who spoke already in asking the Board of Trustee or the Board of Regents uh, and the presidents of the universities in Arizona to, to, to strongly and as ful fulsomely as they can uh, reject these two bills, 2130, or 2178 and 2735. Thank you. Richard Neuhauser, followed by Lori Stoff. Uh, my name is Richard Neuhauser. Uh, I'm here to speak about 2735 as well, uh, which is now in the Arizona legislature. Uh, I'm a tenured professor in the Department of English at ASU uh, and a member of United Campus Workers. My specialty in teaching and research is uh, medieval English literature and culture, something I mentioned for a number of reasons. First of all, uh, our meeting here takes place in an institution which has its origins in the Middle Ages. Universities began in Europe as gatherings of scholars and students and personnel necessary to facilitate instruction, all actively participating in the work of education. Indeed, and this is the second medieval point, universitas, the Latin for university, indicated the entirety of something. In the case of the university, the entirety or community of persons involved in education. And that is to say that the faculty and students and management were thought of as an entirety from the beginning of universities. Of course, attempts were made to control or change this working model over the centuries, but it has remained a remarkably productive one. A case in point, and this is the third reason why it makes sense for me to speak of the Middle Ages here, is the development of an institution within the institution of ASU, namely the Arizona Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies charged with the promotion of the study of pre-modern literatures and cultures. Its reputation reverberates worldwide in the conferences it puts on and in the activities of its press. We have in this center, in other words, evidence of what happens when faculty share responsibility for the development and oversight of academic affairs, when they actively participate in innovative growth at the university. Such active participation and shared responsibility and the shared governance that a number of you have praised so far no longer has a place in HB 2735, where all full responsibility would become the province of ABOR and university presidents alone, and the faculty would be merely consulted through elected assemblies. This bill would drastically undo the model of a community that has led to such innovative matters as the Arizona Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies and many other of the innovative units and programs that ASU is justly proud of. Uh, I urge uh, the uh, members of ABOR and everybody else in the room to oppose HB 2735 contact your Democratic and Republican representatives and senators in the Arizona legislature and ask them to uh, vote it no against it when it comes up for consideration. Thanks for your time. Lori Staff, followed by Alberto Plantillas. Hi, my name is Laurie Stav. I'm also a faculty member here at ASU. I'm going to keep my comments really short. Uh, I know that's a surprise. As a professor, you're like, not possible. Uh, but also because my colleagues just did a fantastic job of saying basically what I also want to say, and that is that I really strongly urge everyone in this room to oppose HB 2735, which would essentially end the longstanding uh, collaborative efforts of university administrations and faculty in the shared governance of university operations, including decisions about academic programs. This kind of collaboration is essential for functioning of our universities. I'll just give you one example. Recently, when we were asked to overhaul the general studies requirements uh, for the entire university, 
This was an incredibly collaborative process in which the administration consulted with somewhere around 500 faculty members at the university and came up with a plan, a new set of requirements that took into consideration the needs of our students first and foremost, which our faculty are keenly aware of. Without that kind of collaboration possible, I fear that it would do great harm to our universities. Thank you. Alberto Plantillas, followed by Liam Bush. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Alberto Plantillas. I'm a member of the Arizona Students Association and a recent graduate from ASU. Um, we, the members of the Arizona Students Association, find that the current state of affairs at the legislature appalling because of ongoing bills like HB 2178 and 2735, which aim to curtail freedom of speech on campus. Instead of helping students deal with the ongoing affordability crisis in our state, legislators instead want to restrict and condition how student governments can fund clubs on campus. These bills are not in the best interest of Arizona students, and if passed, they will set back the student movement for years to come. We believed in a shared governance that works impartially and dutifully to live up to the many supporters of American democracy. We desire safe spaces from censorship under the ideals that this country was founded on. Suppression of speech should not be tolerated in the melting pot of ideas that is our great nation. We have the constitutional ideals and the student movement behind us. We demand shared governance. Additionally, we stand in solidarity with the United Campus Workers Chop from the Top campaign, urging President Robbins and ABOR to reduce or eliminate the highest positions in administration, first before making cuts to academic units at the University of Arizona. We demand shared governance. Thank you very much. Liam Bush, followed by Mark Stegman. My name is Liam Bush, and I am a graduate student in the Mathematics PhD program at the University of Arizona. I would like to begin by saying how happy I and the other graduate students at the school are with the recent mandatory fee changes that will be saving GAs a significant amount of money each year, an especially important thing for us as the cost of living across the country continues to rise. However, I have two questions left. First, uh, why do our international students still have to pay the $200 international student fee per semester? And second, why are my friends here at ASU still being forced to pay mandatory fees for the so-called privilege of working at the university? Uh, I would like to uh, specifically ask the administrators of ASU uh, why you can't cover your graduate assistants while the Wildcats over in Tucson are making sure that our grad assistants aren't being left behind in the midst of a financial crisis. Our president, Robert Robbins, uh, said at the start of our crisis that all bleeding stops eventually. And your insistence on scraping upwards of $2,000 every year back from your employees as our landlords and grocers demand ever more money from us and while the uh, uh, allowing, if not actively pushing, for vile legislation such as House Bills 2178 and 2735 make it clear to all that you are only interested in opening the wounds of your students and employees even further. I implore you to reconsider your stance, listen to your employees, and not force them to pay to work. I yield my time. Our final speaker, Mark Stegman. Well, I came with somewhat prepared remarks, but I'm going to speak substantially on something different. I have taught in the Eller College uh, at University of Arizona for 20 years. 
I own apartment complexes in Tucson. I plan to spend the rest of my life there. I have a deep commitment to the university and the community. I was elected three times to the board of the Tucson Unified School District and served as president four times. I know from that experience how difficult it is to be on a governing board and try to run and, and supervise just one CEO, much less three. I really can't imagine how that process works. And you have my sympathy for that. There are many faculty at the university who have served many more decades than I have who have lived in Tucson, made a life commitment to the university, and served it with great distinction, and have a tremendous commitment, and often do much work in shared governance for no compensation. I am currently the parliamentarian. I am serving my third year as the parliamentarian of the Faculty Senate. This is a position that has no formal authority in our system unlike some, it has effect only by persuasion. I have endeavored through these nearly three years very hard to increase the efficiency and professionalism of the Senate. We have meetings that are steps forward and we have meetings that are steps backward. I do believe that those who watch the Senate week in and week out would say, on the whole, we are moving forward. We obviously have some ways to go. I would say that there are 70 members of the Senate. It should not be judged by those 10 who speak the loudest. There are dozens of senators, I can say certainly, who care deeply about shared governance and want to make it work. It is not true that people are unwilling to run against the regime. I ran against the regime in the last election. I did not, and I did not run with a tone of hostility. I ran with a tone of hoping that I, in that position, could do more to increase the professionalism and efficiency of the Senate. Not only should you not judge that I understand time limits too, having been in Fred's position. Not only should you not judge the Senate by the loudest few, you should not judge the faculty by the Senate, and you should not judge people by their worst moments. We know that the university has gone through many difficulties in the last few years. This makes the faculty scared and concerned. We know that mistakes have happened. Where accountability lies for that is not my job, perhaps your job but the faculty is not in its best moment. We should make decisions with a view to the long-run health of the university. Shared governance is part of the long-run health of the university, and many of us are committed to making that work in a professional, efficient, and collaborative way. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Duvall. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank everyone for your important comments. Um, we've taken notes, we've heard you, and, and very grateful. Um, I would now like to draw everyone's attention to uh, an upcoming event of which we're excited and annually very proud, which is the Regents Cup. It is scheduled for March 22nd, 23rd at the ASU downtown campus. And for those of you uh, unaware of this program, this is the board's tri-university student debate competition that celebrates free speech and civil discourse. The Regents Cup honors participants for articulating different points of view in an environment where competitors remain civil and respectful. This year's students represent a wide range of college majors, from political science and economics to philosophy and biology, and they share a unified commitment to practicing free speech and civil discourse. This year's competition is centered around the theme of democracy, justice, and the rule of law. It will be at the Thunderbird School of Global Management, excuse me, in the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. You can visit the board's website to learn more, but I encourage you all to join us at this event and see what it's all about. I promise you that the afternoon is thought-provoking, it's inspiring, and truly uh, amazing and uplifting.
Today, uh, we will hear an update from President Crow on the state of ASU. President Crow, we always look forward to this report. On our agenda today is the approval of the creation of the new ASU School of Medicine and Advanced Medical Engineering at Arizona State University. Um, and this is clearly an extraordinary moment for healthcare in Arizona. ASU's new medical program is a component of Arizona Healthy Tomorrow, a bold initiative by this board that aims to rapidly increase Arizona's healthcare workforce, which is in serious need of attention. We need more doctors, nurses, allied health significantly to, to catch up, take care of our uh, citizens and taxpayers. ASU program and new medical school will increase our state's health care workforce and lead to better access to care for Arizonans. I want to share a graphic about the scope of Arizona Healthy Tomorrow and the important work ahead that it will ensure that we have the health care workforce that will care for our health and ensure our families have access to the care that they need. This is the array of, by the numbers, of what Arizona Healthy Tomorrow is all about. It is robust. It is unprecedented. It seeks to meet this need, and it requires all three of our universities to do their part. Uh, and we're excited by the pace and acceleration uh, that, that we're pursuing. With nearly 3 million residents lacking primary care and access, and over one in three hospitals facing critical staffing short shortages, this initiative is simply crucial. Northern Arizona University is also establishing a new medical school, and the University of Arizona seeks to double its medical school graduates, along with nurses, allied health, and others that I've mentioned. I want to thank all the presidents and their teams for the vision and leadership to drive these important outcomes forward for Arizona Healthy Tomorrow. Before we hear from President Crow, the, the board is asked to approve the consent agenda. This is items on the consent agenda include items 8 through 19. Does anyone have a conflict to declare on the items scheduled for consent? Seeing none, I move that the board approve items 8 through 19 as listed on the consent agenda. Is there a second? second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes. Okay, showtime. President Crow and his team will provide a report on the state of the ASU public enterprise in Arizona State University. President uh, Crow, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Regent Duvall, and um, let me just contextualize all of this for the Regents. This is the annual presentation of the status of the university as implemented in what used to be referred to as the Operational and Financial Review of the Institution as designed by former Regent Mariucci. I don't know how many years we've done this. It must be about 10 at this point. Uh, Morgan, do you remember? I think about 10. And so, so this report follows those initial guidelines in terms of bringing the board up to speed on exactly sort of where we are. I've got uh, with us, uh, if you're a dean at ASU, raise your hand. So the deans are here. If you're, if you're on the senior leadership team at ASU and right, your executive committee, raise your hand. So we've got um, uh, the senior uh, leadership of ASU is here with us and they'll be available for questions and comments or what have you and I might, I might call on them. The presentation is, is, uh, has a lot of graphics. I'm going to fly through the graphics. I'm going to highlight particular points along the way about how we're doing and where we are and how we're evolving and so forth and so on. And I'm going to stand right about here. So I apologize to Regents. You have some screens in front of you. But I'm going to stand right about here if that's all right with everyone. And it's no disrespect to the, uh, to the audience. We are a designed institution uh, as opposed to an off-the-shelf institution. Uh, we began as the uh, uh, Territorial Teachers College, our headquarters building, which was built before 1900, is just uh, a couple hundred meters from our present location. Uh, what I mean by designed is that uh, we are not just a version of something built somewhere else. We decided some time ago that the intent of the founders of Arizona was that this was going to be a unique place and that ultimately uh, the institutions of higher education would find their Arizona way and would be reflective of what Arizona wants to achieve. And our institution has then embarked, particularly in the last 22 years under uh, uh, my appointment, this was what I was hired to do, was to propose a design, to advance a design, to implement a design, and to see if the design could be successful. So we are designed around this. This is a very powerful document, which is our charter. The charter is essential to who we are. Uh, for all of the debate that's going on around the country about the concept of inclusion, it's the first sentence of our charter. 
We will measure ourselves by whom we include, not who we exclude, and how they succeed. That has not been our historic way of working. That's not the general design of universities overall, which become very elitist in their orientation by measuring success based on selectivity and exclusion. You'll see some numbers going forward. There's nothing new to Regents about this, but it's just important to note that this is not an off-the-shelf thing. Off-the-shelf institutions going forward at the speed of change in the 21st century, socially, culturally, technologically, politically, in every possible way, they're going to have hard rows to hoe. An element of our design in the last point is that we want to take responsibility as an institution for our communities. If K-12 is underperforming, if we're not advancing well enough to provide adaptation to a rapidly evolving, technologically changing economy, well, we're partly responsible for that and should take responsibility for that. So the design of our institution moves in that direction. Now, once we move past our charter, we have what we call design aspirations. Now, we had eight of these for the last 20 plus years. We added the last one, practice principled innovation. I'm not going to walk through them other than to suggest just by pointing at one of them, enable student success. ASU is committed to the success of each unique student. Well, for us, not being an institution that pre-selects students that are already identified because of their previous success to be highly probable of success going forward above the 0.95 probability, 95% probability of success upon entry, we, we, we take every qualified student, and the key word here is each unique student. And we pursue the success of each of those unique students in every possible way, through every tool that we can possibly find, every tool we can invent, every tool we can partner with someone else to do, every new way that we can work with our deans and work with our faculty to be able to achieve these kinds of things. And this is an unbelievable set of aspirations for us. We're nowhere near where we would like to be. We have not achieved our highest levels of success yet, but we are on this path of, of design aspiration. Now, this is a chart. All the regions have seen it. It's a goofy chart to a lot of people. The core of knowledge, that is all that we know as a species, is an ever-expanding thing. Biological knowledge, cultural understanding, cultural expansions, the idea of liberty, the idea of citizenry, the idea of identity. All of these things are evolving constantly, and our knowledge and our understanding is expanding at all times. We've built a university around that that has decided now to teach and learn in five realms, four of which are now operational. The fifth one, what we call personalized, universally accessible, high-intensity learning solutions to the individual, you could call this driving individual liberty to the possible to the highest possible level by providing to you the individual that which you need to learn want to learn want to have to move yourself forward and so we're now operational across all of these now you're going to see what the benefit of that is but to do that our design off the shelf off the shelf universities don't operate with these three enterprises and this is just a a three or four year idea i don't know how we're going to end up here overall but we have three enterprise leaders, Maria Anguiano, Nancy Gonzalez, and Sally Morton are our enterprise leaders right here. These three women are leading the institution into maximum service to the people by providing the traditional ASU version of a traditional university in the academic enterprise, by providing to the people who want to learn every learning asset that we can give them through the learning enterprise and by creating for Arizona a knowledge enterprise that can help us to, for instance, we just want a major project to help lay down the track for new economies built around the concepts of sustainability. So how do we build an economy which enhances environmental outcomes and sustainability outcomes and generates wealth at the same time? How do we do those things at the same time? Well, the knowledge enterprise works towards that objective. Now, earlier there were discussions about different kinds of institutions, and you'll note that we refer to ourselves as a public enterprise. And so the professor in me said, well, I probably ought to define these terms. And so on the left, private company, profit maximization is the animating purpose of the private company, period. That is the purpose of the company. 
It's owned by an, a family. It's owned by individuals. It's not a publicly traded company. You have public companies or private enterprises. Omni Hotels, a partner of ASU, is a private company. Marriott International, another hotel company, they're a public company, publicly traded with governing systems and governing boards and so forth and so on. And Stanford University is a private enterprise. You have state-owned enterprises like Amtrak and other kinds of things. And then you have what we call a public enterprise, like the Salt River Project, like Arizona State University, owned by the people. We have uh, various types of legal formations. And we have objectives, social objectives that we're working toward, public objectives that we're working toward. And then we have what we call the public agency model. Most public universities in the United States operate as public agencies. You all have allowed us to evolve as a public enterprise. And I just want to put this chart up here. It might be useful in terms of the, the evolution of the way that we work. Every year we report this report. How are we doing financially? Remember, the report is the operational and financial review presentation of the institution. So I want to give you an update of how we're doing financially. And let me start with the fact that 20 years ago in 2004, and these are the names of the regents at the time and the governor at the time, I was asked by the regents to try to explain how weird things were happening at ASU. How was it that ASU was doing A or B or C and that it was different than the off-the-shelf model of most universities around the country. It was an extremely aggravating question to me. What I mean by that is I was asked on my appointment in 2002 to help design a new kind of system. You don't just design a theoretical system that might work financially. You design an intellectual idea for the university, a conceptual idea for the university with its charter, then you also design a financial mechanism by which the university can achieve those goals. I was also told on hiring by the chair of the search committee, Don Ulrich, who I spent many, many, many hours with, we don't want any more handout universities. Just have your handout. The universities at the time were referred to as the three amigos, I was told. And all they did was have their handout looking for the three friends looking for resources from the government. So can you build a university that can advance without a reliance on the government only as a way to advance? And so I wrote this note in September of 2004. I sent it to the regents. I'm just presenting it here because it, it conditions everything that follows. And basically the memo, which is quite long, were 15 decisions that we were made that had never been made in the history of the institution before. So 20 years, we can go on forward. And so here's the basic things that we've been doing. We introduced the public enterprise financial model in 04, implement mechanisms that result in quality improvement despite minimal public investment. That means the mindset is to stop waiting for someone else to do something and to do something now. Stop waiting. Aggressively grow and diversify sources of revenue. We used to have three or four sources of revenue. Now we have 18 sources of revenue to centrally manage enterprise resources for strategic deployment. I spent 11 years on the budget committee at Columbia University in New York City, from 1991 to 2002. Torture. <laughs> it was the most torturous thing in my entire existence. All it was about was one college arguing against another college, fighting against another college, fighting against another college, and all I said to myself was that if I ever became a university president, which I had no aspiration to be, I, I, I'm not a positional, aspirational person. I'm an idea aspirational person. I was never going to sit in budget committee meetings arguing between colleges about taxes so that one college, the law school and the business school, law school, business school, we took over half your money at Columbia <laughs> and gave it to other people. And so we didn't do that. And then lastly, create incentives for colleges and schools to be responsible for to be responsible academic entrepreneurs. Now, what does that mean? Well, the state, when I got here, was spending $42,000 per graduate. Today, the state is spending $11,000 per graduate. OK. Don Ulrich, rest his soul, is long gone. This is one of the things that they asked for when I was appointed. So we've lowered by a factor of four the cost to the people to invest in and graduate a person from our institution with an improving quality of the degree along the way. 
with an improving quality of the degree along the way. Second, state appropriations against other universities. So this is how we changed. Well, how are we doing relative to others? Well, I don't know what's going on in New Jersey. <laughs> and my friend Jonathan over there who's running things, and he's got a tough assignment. But he's got $60,000 per graduate. And the only people that are beating us are these people in Colorado, and we don't have any idea what's going on up there. I was just up there. I smelled a lot of... <laughs> skunk. I smelled a lot of skunk up there. That's right. <laughs> I was just up there over the last weekend. And so that could be a factor, but... <laughs> but we're way down here. State appropriations per degree. Oh, I went the wrong way, sorry. So, so here's where we were when we started in terms of what co what's called education and general expenses per headcount. So, so basically, that's what we're spending for students and their, gra and their success. So, so it turns out that we have lowered our expenses by $6,300 in current use dollars uh, uh, in 2023, 2023 dollars uh, along the way. So here's an important chart. So this is how much do all these universities, Purdue, University of Illinois at Urbana, Ohio State, Rutgers, Texas, Austin, Colorado, Virginia, Washington State, Pittsburgh, Iowa, Michigan State, Minnesota, big, national, successful universities. Well, what do they spend on students and instruction? Well, this is us with just under 70% of our spend on these things, and this is the comparable numbers as drawn from national databases for everyone else. So we're a very, very, very focused institution. This is the number of employees per 100 students. Over at North Carolina Chapel Hill, 32. ASU, 7.3. The point is that we are efficient. We have figured out how to be efficient. Revenue. So again, the people's revenue to us is this black column line across the bottom. That's the people's revenue in the institution. The people of Arizona through tax resources giving us that amount of money. Well, obviously, we found some other resources. And our revenue continues to, to grow. And then just to put it into clarity, so since COVID, $3.7 billion to $5.2 billion of revenue in those years since COVID. So just zeroing in for that. So this model is working. We're raising money. We're going to try to raise $600 million a year in 2028. Our endowment now is above $1.55 billion. That's a huge progress for us. It's up, up from a, a small number. Still a small number, but up from a small number. And then going forward, so remember we talked about aggressively growing and diversifying resources. So in addition to growth, these are resources that we intend to generate, new resources we intend to generate in the next five years. And even to our deans that are sitting here, and even to the audience that's sitting here, this is the method by which we fund the university is by the resources that we acquire. There's no, there's no assumption that we're going to go to the legislature and the legislature is going to fund the institution. In fact, what we've said to the legislature, which still isn't sinking in, please fund the students. Please help the students to come to the university. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. And then occasionally, if you want us to do something special, like mount up national laboratories that, you know, uh, uh, convert all the photons coming to Arizona into electricity to be sold with an excise tax to California, generating a whole new revenue stream to Arizona. Well, we could do that, but we need help to do that. And so these are the amounts of resources, a billion dollars of new revenue just from these activities, just to give you a sense that we understand this. Now, our net position, including our component units, looks like this. So Morgan, what does is, what is net position reveal to our deans back here who are wondering. Judy's wondering. So net position is essentially net assets. Uh, assets less liabilities equals net position or assets. And this is essentially our, our balance sheet strength, which allows us to be able to do the things that we need to do to achieve our, our mission and the charter over time as, as we scale the institution. You know, we have to have uh, adequate resources to be able to uh, handle uh, increased expenses, certain volatility in revenue streams, 
to be able to uh, access capital uh, in the credit markets at a, a low cost of capital, those types of things. And so this number over the last decade has increased about 2.5%. This does include, as President Crow indicated, our component units. So this is what we would call an enterprise view of our capabilities, meaning it's, it's uh, the university proper that you would see in our comprehensive annual financial report plus our component units. And so, as you can see, uh, as you know, we've expanded enrollment, as we've expanded the types of things we do, as we've expanded research, as we've expanded the reach of the university, we've been able to grow our financial assets during that time to allow for capabilities to do, continue to do that over time. So just to be clear, and I'll show you some other slides, that doesn't mean we don't have innumerable problems unbelievable problems, unbelievable challenges, unbelievably difficult decisions. Revenue that we thought we were going to have that we didn't end up getting. Other revenue we didn't know we were going to get that we ended up getting. Revenue that, we, that came to us, massive revenues that came to us during COVID, all kinds of things that were happening, every kind of disruption that you can possibly imagine. This is the net result of our running the system, tweaking the knobs, making the decisions, making thousands and thousands and thousands of decisions that lead to this. Now, liquid cash on hand, $1.525 billion. Just Morgan, what's $1.525 billion mean for cash on hand for this institution? Well, so the term liquidity indicates that you have the ability to uh, pay uh, your bills uh, at any given point in time. There are various measures of that, but just for example, our, our average payroll every two weeks is around $60 million. And, and so you know, we have to have a lot of uh, liquidity to be able to cover those types of costs. And also if bad things happen, uh, if uh, there's oh, by a the way, a pandemic. It's they always happen. <laughs> <laughs> that, that electrical system on the West Valley campus decides to blow up one day and knock the entire campus out of operation for several days. That's a bad thing. Yeah, we, we enjoy variety and, uh, and challenges, and uh, that would be an example. But uh, what, what this has meant is, is that uh, we've been able to retain the uh, ability to you know, cover our costs, including some volatility over time as the university has grown. So days cash on hand, low benchmark, high benchmark, we're in the zone. This is also complicated. Things can come up. Things can happen. Oh, by the way, you know, you have a... $80 million problem you have to solve or a $30 million this that you have to fix or some problem here or some problem there, but this gives you a sense of that. And then, and then working group matrix, which are these folks here in the front row, this, this group here is the institution group that focuses on what is our strategy? What is our financial model? What are the most difficult things that we have to decide? How are we going to advance and how are we going to make things move forward? And you, you know all of these people except Shireen you've met, uh, who's our new executive vice president for ASU Health and brings as a former university president, dean at Rutgers Medical, dean at Mayo Medical, brings a level of, of knowledge and expertise to us. And so this is the group that develops financial strategy and tactics. That's the point that I'm trying to make here. Then we have this group, which is called Working Group Finance. And Working Group Finance has all of working group matrixes on it and several other people like Rich Stanley, Rich is here, former uh, executive vice provost at NYU. Uh, we have Matt Smith, who's our basically our vice president for budget planning and management. He's the former budget director at uh, Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island, former university president, former CFO of Purdue, former CFO of UC Riverside, uh, former dean, former leader, uh, a number of us, including myself, have uh, uh, company experience as board directors and members and so forth and so on. So this is a mixed group, lots and lots of private university experience, lots of financial experience outside of universities. And so again, if you're going to launch a new design, go back to my first slide, you don't need the same people. You need different people. And this is working group finance. So let me ask um, Sally. So nobody knows I'm going to ask on them. So Sally, Executive Vice President uh, for uh, the University and Chief of the Knowledge Enterprise. So in Working Group Finance, what are, what are we focused on? What are we talking about when you're at those meetings? We're talking about strategy, revenue enhancement. I think 
you said difficult decisions, where are we going? Trying to anticipate and discuss different options. And I think the variety of experience of people on working group finance helps us do that in a very robust and comprehensive way. So have you ever been responsible for a business unit with a bottom line in a knowledge related area? Yes. And then tell, tell me about that experience and how does that work? Uh, when I was at RTI International, I had profit loss responsibility for about $55 million of the income for uh, RTI, which is about a tenth of their revenue at that time. So you were one of the leaders running part of the business, generating the revenue for that group. And so, so all of the individuals on this group are, even this lawyer, also known as Jim O'Brien. <laughs> all everyone that's in this group is focused on is focused on financial tactics and operations. Let me make the let me show you the difference: strategy and tactics. Where are we going? Five-year thinking strategic decisions, acquisitions, uh, uh, all kinds of things. Strategy and tactics. Tactics are two to three years. Strategy is where are we going overall versus tactics and operations. Centralized operational control is a fundamental basis of the way that we operate. And I'm gonna call on Morgan just to talk about what centralized operational control is. And then I'm gonna call on one of the deans. I'm gonna look at their faces. They don't even know I'm gonna call on them. Let's see what, so Morgan. So uh, what we try to do is, is take a look at uh, the university's resources uh, at an enterprise perspective and figure out how to get things done. And so when I looked at those two charts, uh, I kind of looked at, uh, I, would, I would describe working group matrix as what? In other words, what are we trying to do? What are our strategies, et cetera? Working group finance, which has some overlap and some other people involved, is really how? And you know our, our job really is to figure out how to do the things that the university needs to do and be able to do them consistently over time. And in order to do that, uh, we believe it's uh, important you know to uh, drive strategic decisions through the organization. Uh, you know, I, I suspect uh, that probably there are, are folks in this room who would be happy to say, well, you know, gosh, we could really use some more money, and that would be true. Uh, and what we try to do is balance various considerations and come up with the best plan for the institution overall to allow us to achieve our mission. We do not operate under the model that the university that I came from operated, which was called responsibility-centered management. We do not operate under that model. We operate under centralized budgeting, allocating to the colleges, and then the colleges take those resources and advance against their goals with other resources that they can also acquire. So I'm just Picking Judy, who is our Dean of Nursing, Edson College of Nursing and Health Innovation. She doesn't know I was going to call on her. I have no idea what she's going to say. But she's been a dean before at a private university in California. So, so how, do, how do you work financially? So as uh, Morgan Let's mentioned, just stand up so everybody can as, as Morgan mentioned, we um, get allocations and we are challenged to be entrepreneurial and innovative. So you get an allocation. Here's the amount of money that you get. Yeah. And we uh, we then use that in a, in a as creative way as possible to uh, meet our goals. And we work with our fellow deans about actually we do we do not steal from each other, uh, and that can be around programming, but it can be on good ideas to. Um, acquire new resources and that's different than at my previous university because it was a fixed pie so if you got a little bit more that meant somebody got a little bit less but at ASU we work on just making a bigger pie yeah so I'm gonna ask uh, uh, Carol Basil who's the Dean of the Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College and was also uh, a Dean before at another institution a public institution so Carol So at the Teachers College, we also get our piece of the pie. Uh, but we are have been very entrepreneurial in terms of, uh, in last couple years, thinking about mergers and acquisitions. Uh, we have acquired probably four or five now uh, nonprofit organizations, organizations that have been at other institutions, bringing them in, all of which pay for themselves, um, but all of which are really uh, increasing and creating visibility for the college and for the university. And so that has been a tact that we have been using in order to start to think about that. We are also building uh, with uh, Learning Enterprise uh, the ASU, Professional Educator Learning Hub, which also will expand what we do, how we offer it, who we offer it to, and hopefully uh, be additional revenue stream. So I'm going to ask one of the liberal arts and sciences deans, I'm going to ask Jeffrey Cohen to comment on, he's dean of humanities, just, you know, humanities aren't dead, you know, sorry to tell you that for those of you that wanted them to go away. 
uh, they're, they're not leaving anywhere any, anytime soon. And so, so at, at your level as a divisional dean inside a superstructure called the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences Resources, both, both resources, general resources, and then special resources. So one of the things uh, that this budget model does allow and allows us not to worry so much about humanities being defunded or money moving away from us is every incentive is to grow our own resources. So the number of students that we have online has a direct impact on our three interdisciplinary schools, how much money comes back to them. We work hard when it comes to philanthropy. There are lots of people that want to support us out in the community and many foundations. Really, I, I would say one of the great benefits of the budget model we have is it turns every dean into an entrepreneur who's working hard for the students, for the faculty, and making sure that what we do really resonates with the communities we serve. And then what about when something comes up that's outside of your budget model, that some great superstar that you want to uh, acquire, what happens? And have you ever acquired any recently? We are fortunate to have acquired many superstars, um, and we've done it in a variety of ways. The president has strategic initiative funding that's been absolutely instrumental for some transformative hiring, and sometimes we take it out of our own budget. There are lots of different ways to do it, but as a result of it, we've had two recent Pulitzers, MacArthur geniuses, you name it. We, we are the envy of other institutions when it comes to humanities hiring. Now, now, just to give you some sense of Columbia, so when I arrived at Columbia University in 1991 as uh, first initially appointed as vice provost uh, and then later executive vice provost after two other steps along the way, the dean of business refused to meet with me because there was no material reason to meet with me. And then later, years later, when I made a decision on the budget committee which really got that guy, I said you should have met with me. <laughs> and so, and so the, the reason that I say that to you is that the contest between the deans was a contest for fighting over resources inside the institution. It wasn't about figuring out what the institution could do at the same time and working together. And, and uh, which of the deans have relationships with more than three other colleges? Yeah, almost everybody. And so that's just very, very common. I don't know who I stole this from. <laughs> Lev. You know, Lev Gonick, who's our chief information officer, you may not know this, that he actually is an artificial intelligence <laughs> object. He's not even physically here. He's, he's actually in Cleveland right now. So these are what we were just talking about. So this is just putting this down for the record in terms of how we work. We continue to build capacity for enterprise level initiatives. Revenues are managed centrally with regular discussions with units about how they're needed for growth and expertise and so forth and so on. So I'm going to ask Nancy Gonzalez as a provost just to comment on working with the deans. It's not a hellaciously argumentative process. So, so how do, what, what do we do with growth? I'm just trying to give the regents a sense of how, of how we work. So Nancy is the executive vice pre, uh, president for the university and chief of the academic enterprise and provost of the university. Uh, in addition to being, you know, as all of our deans are, distinguished academics themselves. So how do we do this? Do, we get, do you gather everyone together and you have like these unbelievable arguments like we did with people storming out of the room and kicking the table and saying they're never going to work with us again and making me take the subway up to the medical school over and over and over and over like I used to have to to calm the medical school dean down? Do you do all of that? No, not, not exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, actually, I will just say that all of our deans have this entrepreneurial mindset, and, and they have it by the time they finish their first set of interviews when they're applying for the job and, and before they sign on the dotted line. They know that's the job that they're being hired to do. And the process is really about their vision, you know, that they set, you know, as leaders with their colleges. What is it that you want to achieve for your disciplines, for your fields, for the state, the nation, the world, what, you know, what do the humanities want to achieve, you know, what does the law school want to achieve, and then they start to understand what resources do they have to do that, and what is it going to take to get there. Well, what resources do they have to start to do that? We're not giving them all the resources. No, no, everybody has something to start, and then yeah. they have to build, and so it really is an ROI um, a model where they, they develop a plan, 
and they invest, and then they, they start to see returns on good ideas. Not all ideas are good, but a, a, a whole lot of them really are because they're visionary people with exciting ideas. And then the money starts to come in, and you have to then invest at, at, to support the growth that, that hopefully comes from that. So we have this thing that we publish every year or every other year. We've done like 11 of these or 15 of these. And what we do every year is we then say, what are we going to try to do in the next five years or every year and a half or so? So this is the one 2024 to 2029. There's nothing new about this. You see all of this. This is the one and only document that we, that we uh, advance. It's called Mission and Goals. And so I'm not going to walk you through. They have these five categories. We have the new goal that the board has given us at the bottom. Design and launch ASU Health as a comprehensive cluster of teaching, learning, and discovery health systems for the enhancement of social scale health outcomes. You might note that it's not become the best medical school in the universe, become the highest ranked nursing school that God has ever created. You know, that's not on our list. This is what's on our list. So these are the five categories of goals that we are pursuing, four of which we've been pursuing since day one. Each of them, this is the first one, I'm just reorienting you is manifested by measurable markers of progress along the way to which we are all held accountable within ourselves. And all of the goals that the regents have given us are embedded in these goals. So I'm not going to go back through the goals other than this is an accessible institution growing to be of greater service. How are we doing? Enrollment, highest levels ever. We can come back to any of these charts. Total enrollment since COVID, 136,000 students growing by 46,000 students, mostly online since COVID. I just want that to, everyone to process that. So we're not having issues on that front. We have issues relative to Arizona students. And I'm going to spend some time talking about that. We have issues to having aspirations, eyes somewhat greater than our stomachs occasionally. When we think we're going to get all of these out-of-state students and it's going to be fabulous and then we get a few less and we already spent the money, well, we got all kinds of problems for that, don't we, Rich? Indeed. <laughs> Rich's job is to keep the chunky guy, me, on track, <laughs> not too far off track. So I wanted to make this slide mostly the gold line, but just to let you know how hard this is. So in 2013, 10 years ago, we had 5,796 First-year students join our first-year class as undergraduates coming out of high school. And today we have, in 2022, we had 8,709. 3,000 more. So when somebody says you're not impacting Arizona, we are impacting Arizona. We got 3,000 more freshmen in our freshman class, in our first-year class. In fact, 10.5% of the Arizona public high school graduates are enrolled at ASU in the fall of 2022. That's a massive number. These are a, this is a tough line to grow, a very tough line to grow, and it's financially very difficult, and I'm going to explain why that is in a second. We've done a great job, and the provost understands because I send her notes all hours of the night and day on this, which is how do we get to the higher levels of retention. We've made a lot of progress. We're continuing to make progress. COVID hurt us a little bit. Graduation rates, lots of progress, very significant process. Take a look at this blue one. Four-year community college transfer rate successful in graduation. This is a big success for us. It wasn't the case in the past, and it is the case now. Degrees. So we're approaching 40,000 degrees. When I took office, we had 40,000 students. Now we're approaching 40,000 degrees. Now, we kept our cost modest. Um, I'm going to tell you why modest. $12,223 is nearly impossible for families of low income and modern income. I'm going to talk about how that works. But remember, our goal, continuing to enhance quality while maintaining affordability. Well, let's look at affordability. And this is one of the most important charts. People don't pay attention to this chart. It's really, really important. So this is how this chart works. Every undergraduate from Arizona is on this chart at ASU in our campus immersion programs for our full tuition rate. 6,500 of them make come from families with less than $20,000 of income in the family. The chart will tell you that their cost of attendance for tuition is zero. In fact, they receive scholarships above their cost of attendance to help them to attend the university. These are scholarships only, no loans. The next category, under 35,000, zero. The next category, under 50,000, zero. 
Under 65,000, the cost is 400 and, well, it's still zero. Or, yeah. And so the net price, the maroon thing on the right, $2,637. So after all scholarship funds, no loans are made available to students from Arizona. The average tuition for a student from Arizona to attend Arizona State University, a world-class research university, is $2,637. <clears throat> this is a, an unbelievably difficult thing to derive to make this work because the green bar is the state's investment in financial aid. The yellow bar is the federal government's investment through Pell Grants in financial aid. The orange bar is our investment in financial aid. It's unbelievable. And then you can see a little bit that we have from gifts in the blue bar. That means we have to run the institution in a way to generate all that revenue to make this financial aid available to these students so that they can attend. We often get criticized that lower income students are the benefactors of all the university's investment. Not true. Take a look at the commonality of the orange bar. And so we've made this work. This is unbelievably difficult. So let's see. I thought I saw Doc, Mr. Hopkins. Yes. So, so Kent Hopkins, who is our Vice President for Enrollment Management, So, so Kent, why is this difficult? And why is it why is it difficult to make this all work? Well, we love our jobs. Wait. Go ahead. Good afternoon. We love our jobs. There's lots to love, but we focus singularly on student success and as a partner, institutional success. And it's really important for us as we work with our Arizona citizens. I mean, just think about this for a second. Look at that average income and look what COVID did to our Arizona students. We were actually on a really large trajectory and COVID hit our socioeconomically disadvantaged families the most. And so sometimes even what we provide in terms of tuition and housing and educational expenses still isn't enough. And so that's why we work very closely on helping students um, secure jobs that are meaningful. And By the way, 16,943 ASU students have a job from ASU generating a check. 16,943 students. Thank you, Michael. I, did, I just happened to have that slide. You didn't know that. <laughs> so, so this is a difficult process. And we understand our mission. Our mission is to make certain that no one is left out of Arizona State University from the state of Arizona for financial reasons. I'm guaranteeing you that if they don't talk to us, we can't help them. But if they talk to us, we're going to help them. If your parents get divorced along the way, if something collapses, your parents' family business collapses, we make, we make on-the-fly adjustments. We make adjustments all the time to make this work. That has helped our enrollment to increase. But oh, by the way, in the last <clears throat> six years, or last, let's just say the last 10 years, we went ahead and built another university for Arizona with no capital costs. 16,000 Arizonans attending ASU for full, full-fledged, full designed by our faculty, managed by our, our deans, degrees from Arizona State University faculty. 16,525 residents are attending ASU that way right now for their degrees. Didn't even exist in 2013. Now, half the people over there know that this is one of my obsession projects right now. Who thinks it's one of my obsessions? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and, so, and so why is it my obsession? So it is that this is the empowerment of Realm 4 learning. How do we take a kid who cannot learn biology or chemistry or, or math or abstract art history or some other uh, abstract thing about how the earth works or whatever the subject is because of the way it's taught, not because of the way it's learned. It's the, it's the teacher also, not just the learner. So we've built these tools for enhanced student success. So just take a look at this. 
22,000 students have found a new way to learn biology. We built a whole series of courses here. I thought I saw Phil Regeer here. So University Dean Phil Regeer and Chief Executive Officer of Ed Plus at ASU. So, so Phil, this is just to try to give the regents a sense of how this works. And oh, by the way, all of this also ultimately leads to more revenue because more people can learn biology in this particular thing. Just explain, explain that biospine part. What are each of those little balls and how does it work? Yeah, so each of the little balls are classes. Is that, is that turned on? I hope it's turned on. And then Ken Rowe, why don't you come up also? So Ken Rowe Kasumi, who's the Dean of ASU Science. Yeah, each of the little balls represent a class that any biology major has to make. And I don't know, Ken Rowe, how many biology majors are there? How many programs? 8,000. Oh, yeah, we have 8,000 students. We have about 5,000 students but online. Not 8,000. We have 8,000 biology majors. Biology majors. <laughs> and we have m many different biology programs, right? And, but regardless of the program you're taking in biology, you have to take these 10 courses. And the important thing about these 10 courses is that the faculty worked hard to map out the biology <laughs> curriculum. And then once that's mapped out, we figured out ways to link the courses so that if a student gets into course eight, which might be an advanced genetics course, having forgotten something that they learned in the primary genetics course, the system knows and will uh, provide the information to the student. So this is an, a, a, a system of adaptive learning that isn't just within the course, but it also adapts across the curriculum. So, so Ken Rowe is the Dean of uh, ASU Science, Trained, uh, PhD, MIT, who was your major professor? Uh, Eric Lander. A, a Nobel laureate? No? Uh, no, uh, National Academy That's member. a National Academy member. So, so, so elite trained. And so what are you doing with this new technology, both the display virtual reality system that we have to teach the labs and these courses? What do you think you'll be able to do as dean of ASU Science working with your director of the School of Life Sciences in terms of biology enrollment? I mean, this is the time where everyone needs to know some biology. The COVID pandemic clearly made out that you know, we all need to know a little bit about viruses, about the immune system. So now with this neobiology, we, everyone can master biology, can get excited about biology. Uh, you know, we also, you know, the adaptive, you know, we're leaning into AI in terms of this unified curriculum. You know, if you're having a hard time on some parts, you can go back and, and refresh. And then, you know, it, it is, you know, the, I think there's enormous possibilities too for, you know, the industry of the future, the technology of the future. You know, this is the same. So what, what's, our, what's our target number of majors for biology? Uh, we want to have uh, 20,000 biology majors. So when we have 20,000 biology majors, our revenue for biology majors will be so significant that the School of Life Sciences and the provost office and others, one, will be helping people that have no access to biology training. Two, we'll be getting more kids to double major and triple major and so forth and so on. Three, we'll be helping kids that didn't have a chance to go to college or adults that wanted to go to college or adults that want a better job and they need a biology major or some biology courses to get the better job. But our revenue position will go up by millions and millions of dollars also from these technologies. So, thank you. General Studies Gold. I thank the Regents for pushing us very hard to... Uh, revise our gen ed uh, curriculum and so it is revised it's going to be implemented in the fall of 24 uh, including in the middle there the new courses in american institutions governance and civic engagement global communities societies and individuals and sustainability which we're very excited about how do you live on this place called the earth and how do you make sure that it's still there for your great grandchildren nothing wrong with that and so uh this is good anything you want to add to this uh, nancy <coughs> No, actually, I appreciated the comment from the earlier speaker uh, about the process that we used to get here. We're very excited about this. Uh, since we, we passed all the internal approvals, we have been just uh, going as fast as we can to, to make all systems go electronically with our online students, with our community college partners, you know, on ground, every modality that, that needs to be linked in. And we're actually planning to launch Early, not in the fall. We're going early. To launch. Listen to that, Regent Manson. Early. We we will be launching in the with with those enrolling for the first time this summer. Very exciting, and we have about uh, Kent. Don't we have about where did Kent go? About sixty thousand students in the summer. Sixty-five thousand, right? So uh, interesting thing here. So so this line to this direction here, right here, is 
Students at ASU, undergraduates from families under $100,000 of family income. So maroon is where we used to be when this whole redesign got started, and we didn't have many of those kids. Now we got a lot of those kids. We got more of those kids than we've ever had. Gray was along the way. Gold is where we are now, resident and non-resident. So just look at these total numbers. This is not just coming into the freshman class. So we have, yeah, 4,500 in the lowest, 20,000, another 5,000. So 10,000 students under 40,000. We have uh, 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 almost 15,000 students under, under, under 60,000. I'm just running these totals. You know, this is almost 20,000 students. We never had anything like that before. Now that last thing of students from families of more than $400,000 of income, hey, they just like us. <laughs> so they're here, so we're very happy about that. I'm being, I'm being given the hook here, so hold on. So this is, you've seen this slide, this is just the updated version. The, the, my wife has this phrase, she says, if you ever turn into a gray and pasty, she's gonna leave me. So I just decided to take all the white people here and make them gray. And then what, this institution used to be predominantly white, ethnically, no longer. Completely transformed the institution, particularly after we eliminated the silly ways that people were attempting to do that, for which they weren't being successful. So that continues, just to give you some sense of that. I want to point out this fact. This, again, this is the, the performance of the model. So this tells you that all things being equal in 2007, since 2007, we've added 28,000 Pell Grant recipients to the base foundation of the institution's structure, making, meaning that we now have 39,000 students attending ASU who are receiving Pell Grants. We have 28,000 receiving uh, that are first generation, 19,000 more since 2007. We have 5,000 more veteran students than we did, 2,000 more uh, active military students, 9,000 more transfer students since 2007. So the model, the system, is helping us to achieve the goals on which the institution is based. Got all kinds of stuff going on all over the world where there's a dot somewhere in one of those countries, we got something going on. The Sentana schools that are now powered by ASU are in maroon, the yellows are the ones that we might work with. You can see where we've got students coming in, 15,000 students give or take from 150 plus countries. National standing, I'm not gonna belabor the point that ASU is a university with national standing but it's a university with national standing in all of our academic programs. You can look at these. This is the rankings of many programs. Oh, I, 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 got, I know who can comment on this, so. Ohad, the dean of the W.P. Carey School who came to us from Washington University in St. Louis. We're a very highly ranked business school, but we're so overwhelmingly large, the logic of most academics is you can't be both big and good Turns out, false. We are defying this logic. <laughs> uh, just recently, our uh, executive MBA program in China was ranked number 12 in the world by Financial Times. And in that ranking, they also rank research. And we are ranked number tw 20 in the world uh, in research. Uh, our, just recently, our uh, online MBA program was ranked seventh in the nation by U.S. News. Our uh, other online graduate program, Online Business Analytics, was rank, ranked number three in the nation by U.S. News. So, yeah, we, are, we have 21,000 students. We are the largest business school in the United States, and yet our rankings are among the top business schools. So, yes, we can do both. So the, so the, the story is not you know, bragging about our rankings. You're not supposed to be able to do this. You're not supposed to be able to have 20,000 business students and be ranked at this level and make it work financially without much investment from the state. A couple faculty achievements. This one is like astounding to me. So Mickey here, Regents Professor with all kinds of names, endowments, and genius about learning technologies out of the whole genius crew at Carnegie Mellon wins a $3.8 million prize. She won the prize. Olivia. One of the fabulous new hires in the business school for our WP Carey chairs. We're expanding the faculty quality in every aspect of what we're doing through philanthropy and university investment. And then Amber, I think, came as an assistant professor. Uh, uh, 
Maybe PhD student. PhD student. Well, yeah. So she went to the University of Florida, PhD. I think she came as a postdoc. Postdoc, yeah. So she just won a MacArthur Fellowship uh, out of our uh, uh, Center for Global Health. So this, you got to watch these words really carefully, including the ones that are underlined. Expand ASU's role as the leading global center for interdisciplinary research, discovery, and development. I don't say that lightly. That means do these things. There's our research achievement from a research expenditure perspective. The only numbers that have been officially submitted are the 22 numbers. The 23 numbers go in. It's gone in. It's gone in. And then 24 is our estimate. It'll be this range. This is an unbelievable achievement for an institution without a medical school, just to let you know that that's still continuing. Leading knowledge enterprise, I really like this one. NSF, the most elite scientifically funding, science funding organization on the planet. And we're able to beat our older sister, these 400-year-old uh, braggers over here. Remember, I was at a school that was in mortal combat with, with Harvard at all times, and so we had every name you could possibly imagine for Harvard. <laughs> UCLA, USC, two other uh, former Pac-12 schools, Hopkins, the original research university in the United States, and Penn State, a massively successful institution. So what that tells me is that our faculty in the social sciences, the behavioral sciences, in sustainability, in the physical sciences, in the life sciences, in all these areas are as competitive as any faculty that operates anywhere at any university on the planet. And yet we're also going to find a way to graduate 40,000 people and have a 16,000 person online university for Arizonans. So a lot of big stuff going on. We've sent separate notes to the regents about all these things. Sally and her team in the, in the last year and a half to two years has just found a way to close. In the game, we were, all, we were always in the game. We do, used to not win the game. Then we figured out how to win sometimes, mostly through nothing but just unbelievable persistence. We're way beyond persistence now. We're to winning in the first round with the best of them, competing against the best, and these are four examples. Um, Sally, just comment on the upper right, just that one, like what it is. It's a national laboratory in microelectronics by the Defense Department, and so what does it mean? Right, so ASU is leading the SWAP hub, which this is Southwest Advanced Prototyping Hub, which is one of eight hubs in the Department of Defense's microelectronics commons. ASU is the lead organization, but this is across Arizona and a couple of, of close by states as well. Uh, we have 150 industry partners as part of the SWAP hub. And we're just now putting in projects to the Department of Defense. And that's, uh, if, you, if you're successful, that's an annual investment level. If you're successful. Right. Yeah, you gotta keep going. And then Regent Goodyear helped us make this happen by uh, working out uh, some, some complicated interaction issues that we had within Arizona. So this is a, a state investment, a university investment, and a private investment. $270 million into a single project. Massive outcomes. Peter Schlosser is here. I won't ask him to explain this because according to everyone else at ASU, only Peter and I understand this chart. <laughs> and so, yeah, they they're not laughing. <laughs> so what we're doing here is we're building this global futures laboratory, which is going to lay down the economy of the future. I got to tell you, the economy of the future. How are we going to value carbon and make money off of it while taking it out of the atmosphere? How are we going to produce new electricity with electrons uh, and phot with photons producing electrons and other kinds of things. And this is just to show you what's been built, including the four schools, and we're working on a fifth school, uh, Ocean Futures, Complex Adaptive Systems, Sustainability. Now, we don't win everything. We just lost a massive project, a massive project to Northwestern University after making it into the finals on a whole new way of doing math related to understanding how to manage the planet in a better way. So we don't win everything, far from it. We lose, we lose more than we win. We just win a lot because we come to bat a lot. This just shows you that in these subjects, social sciences, humanities, and transdisciplinary, number one among 258 in transdisciplinary science, for instance. Now, this is an important chart. You all are the, the governors of all of this. So we got four academic campuses. You're sitting on one of them. Well, we have seven or eight places where we're rapidly evolving our innovation centers. Skysong you've been to. 
Novus Innovation Corridor, you're aware of, because the university has uh, helped through co-development put about 3 million square feet on that site so far. We've got the new projects in downtown Mesa on the Center for Digital Creativity. The several regions were at the new building that we're building in the Polytechnic campus related to advanced manufacturing. <laughs> Earlier this week, several, uh, some of you were out at the, uh, at the Discovery Oasis, which is a project that we work with in the Mayo Clinic. So these are all places in which the university is advancing innovation clusters through physical development, partnering with the other universities in Arizona in the Phoenix Bioscience Core, the ASU Research Park, and then just rapidly then on the West Valley campus, now renamed and approved by you, particularly for Regent Manson, these are buildings under construction. <laughs> so, so these are things that are happening. And so we have new residence halls, three new schools. You're aware of this. All good things. So this is the new manufacturing building that some regions are at when we, launched, when we had the construction project. This is one of the most important things that we've ever done, a whole new school within engineering. Kyle Squires is here, the Vice Provost and, and Dean of Engineering. And so, so uh, Kyle, just really quickly, uh, when this is up and running and fully operational, what, what will these, these men and women in this building be doing? So think of this building as uh, defining kind of the focus for the future manufacturing. The future manufacturing is what automation, data, robotics, artificial intelligence and those things merge in really interesting ways where the building is not only a place for research and training students but also for partnership. A lot of the East Valley is about manufacturing. They look to the school and this campus basically to provide that leadership. So this is a very expensive facility. It's also at the entrance of the innovation district that we're building on the Polytechnic campus. So we're seeding things and <coughs> making things happen. This is the building. If you haven't been to this, you got to go to this. This is in downtown Mesa. It's the core facility of the new uh, uh, whole thing that we're doing in terms of the Mesa Center for Creative Technology. The city of Mesa is accelerating their investments. We're accelerating these activities. Uh, Stephen Tepper, who's about to jump ship to become the president of Hamilton College. Thank you very much, Stephen, <laughs> and congratulations. He and I have had a number of conversations, including today. He told me today they're still using gas lights at Hamilton College. <laughs> No, no, I didn't tell you that. I said they were almost ready to get them changed out. <laughs> and they'd been debating it since 1887. And so, so, so just tell me, like, what, what go, and I said many other things about, about what you're going to be doing. So, 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 <laughs> so tell me about that. What, how many, like, I saw a note the other day, we have a thousand students already active in this building. Like, just this building here in downtown Mesa, what's going on? Yeah, so first And congratulations all, on your election as president of Hamilton College. Thank you. So. Thank you. First of all, just talking about um, how we pay for things, right? This is a full partnership with the city of Mesa who's invested millions and millions of dollars to create the world's best um, media production uh, facility. We went to Hong Kong, Singapore, to Australia to look at the best facilities and we brought back uh, the future. Uh, this place can do anything. Um, you can, if you can imagine it, you can build it. It is filled with opportunities for extended reality technologies. It's a fabrication center. It's a film production center. It has studios that are as good as any studio in Hollywood. Um, we've got almost 900 students in the Sydney Poitier New American Film Program. We've got multiple graduate degrees that work across the university in immersive technologies, which, you know, as all of you know, every sector, every, healthcare, education, entertainment, retail, construction, all of those sectors need to build immersive worlds where people can collaborate and create and make, and we're training the workforce for that. Um, so, so, so where we're going with this, and, and uh, I appreciate very much Stephen's wisdom and, and, and intent, so we have our LA activities that the board is aware of are connected to this new facilities in downtown Mesa. We think we're going to end up with low thousands of students in our film school activity activity and in our fashion school. And I, I mentioned that earlier as a new uh, revenue stream. stream. So uh, Skysong Innovations, you saw that we were just announced ninth best in the world in terms of patents. Uh, this is uh, going well. When the word sustainability gets banned from the lexicon here in Arizona, we're not sure what we're going to do with the hundreds of companies that we have that are in the sustainable business. I guess they'll have to move somewhere else uh, or something. But, but anyway, yes, it is, it is something that's on my mind. 
Uh, this is just to let you know what we've done online. So no graduates in 09, 85,000 graduates now. And you can see the categories of graduates. Arizona residents, we've gotten 10,000, uh, no, 23,000 Arizona residents who hadn't finished college now finished college. 23,000 people. 11,000 Starbucks people, just to give you a sense that this works. AI, eventually the board's going to be saying to us, like, where are we? What are those weird vibrations I'm feeling from the AI generators when you're on campus? I mean, all that's going to be happening because Lev back there, just wave, Lev. Lev is hooking up with everybody. We're advancing on every front. We're advancing with caution, with care, with concern, but we're interested in one thing. How do we make a better learner, a faster learner, and a more capable and adaptive learner? How do we do that for both our faculty and for our students? Local in, in, impact and social embeddedness. So Maria Anguiano right here, the mysterious EVP that the regents sometimes refer to. She's a regent herself of the University of California. And so uh, we've gone. Our youngest learner in our, in our learning enterprise is 22 months. Our oldest is 96 years old. These are the kinds of numbers that we have involved right now. This is a whole new thing. Uh, Maria, you'll be surprised by this question. So what's so hard about this? <laughs> why, why don't we just like raise the flag and people gather around the flagpole and sign up for our stuff? So what, what's so hard about it? Well, people are signing up for our stuff, but I think creating, you know, we're trying to do a lot of things um, all at once, uh, but really making sure, like one of the reasons that we're creating some short form content is to help people that are usually not connected to universities connect with us and meet them where they are, right? So not necessarily everyone trusts universities, not necessarily everyone knows to plug into a university. So the tough part is actually getting to where learners are, plugging into their communities and giving them those educational opportunities that they need at the time that they need them. And what's this one? Universal Pathways, what is that? So Universal Pathways That's 20,000 plus people, so. Right, is a program um, that is created to, cre to create another pathway for folks to gain admission into ASU. So or, or other universities. Or to other universities. Yes. So if you don't have the GPA or, you know, the background to get into ASU. You didn't take the right courses in high school. You took other courses, not on the college track. You're not qualified to come. Well, how do you get into the university? You take four of our courses and get a B average or above. We will create a spot for you. So 40, 5,400 have been admitted so far. 1,700 are earning their way in this year. This is a big deal, a whole new way of doing things. And so these are things that we never had this before. So Maria and her team working with the deans, working with the provost, working with the faculty have been doing this. I'm not going to walk through all of this, but you know, we still have ASU prep. I think, uh, yes, I, I don't know if we're going to just let's 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 just hear one thing about ASU prep. What's the most exciting thing happening at ASU prep? Well, I think it goes back to us being part of the entrepreneurial DNA of ASU that we are figuring out ways to bring K 12 students, not just for pipeline building, but uh, to generate a workforce of the future. So some of the exciting things we're doing is being responsive to the parent trend to demand flexibility. That's what this... Um, well, like what's this 9,600 rural and underserved learners? What's that? We've got students uh, through partnerships with um, school districts around the state that can't bring high quality assets to their kids, calculus courses, critical languages, and they partner with us to be able to, to get that done. And then, and then how do our kids do that uh, graduate from our schools? Uh, we've got 76% of our students that are going to four-year uh, universities. We've got, um, of our 500 seniors, 167 of them are taking over 15 ASU credits right now. Um, so we're really pushing the ceiling on ASU students, uh, or ASU prep students taking ASU Yeah, courses. right. Thank you. So uh, Career Catalyst is a huge new program. We've got all kinds of new partners. Uh, Let's see, who can tell us about the new Starbucks partnership? Chris or Jim, who wants to do that? Jim. So what's the new Starbucks, the new deal that we have with Starbucks, our selection, beyond the degrees? Yeah. So uh, Starbucks has been a, a relationship that uh, started with the College Achievement Plan, and I think you're all aware we've had 
great success, I think. 11,000 graduates, 25,000 enrollees in degree programs. Expanding access to higher education through the employee-employer relationship and providing uh, a college education for Starbucks employees uh, at no tuition cost. But that relationship with Starbucks, I think, is a model for us then in the way that we can build relationships with private sector companies to do many more things. Uh, in the case of uh, Starbucks, we have brought non-degree learning to Starbucks through the college, uh, the global, uh, global academy, uh, Starbucks Global Academy. And now Starbucks is interested in uh, ASU expanding into other countries of the world with them. So in the future, um, I think the future of Starbucks is not just the American market, it's, it's, it's the world. And so now uh, Starbucks provides us with a partner who's already uh, engaged in the world, who's interested in educating more people, and it provides us a pathway to reach individuals in a completely different way than we ever had before. So, thank you, Jim. So we've got the NSF Regional Innovation Engine that we just uh, won. We've got a $45 million uh, startup fund for new water initiatives, Arizona Water Initiatives, $40 million uh, from Governor Ducey as he was leaving office. Uh, thank you very much, Governor Ducey. $5 million from the Piper Charitable Trust. We're launching, I'm not going to go into the details, the board has been separately briefed and will be briefed even further on the expansion and design of ASU Health. But I am going to ask Shireen, who was the president of a medical Rush Medical University in Chicago. She doesn't know I'm going to ask her this question. I'm going to phrase it in the right way. Let's see. Uh -oh. So Shireen is a world-class scientist, member of the National Academy of Medicine, all these things. You know, has been deans at multiple institutions. Like, what, is there anything different between Rush and ASU? Like, what's, what are the differences? Well, there's just about everything different between <laughs> Rush and, and, and ASU. So the, the ASU Health like, central differentiating feature is that it really isn't uh, a medical school or growth in our nursing school or growth in research. It's all of the above. It's very interdisciplinary. It actually comes from all of the health assets that already exist at ASU. Drawing from the existing university or we couldn't do it. And, and we've, uh, we're, still, we're still counting up what those assets and faculty are. It's, gonna, it's almost a thousand educational assets, uh, many hundreds of faculty. And so it has the broad reach and uh, impact of the entire university, but focused on improving health. So several of these are extremely difficult goals and challenges. A couple of them are almost impossible. Those are the more fun ones, like that bottom one. Let's go ahead and triple current nursing production, Judy, while increasing research by 10x. <laughs> so we're going to be building this school of medical engineering, giving multiple degrees to every student. We're going to be building a new uh, uh, technology and public health school. What do we end up with as the name, Nancy? Technology and public health. Technology and public health. So that's where we're headed on that. We're going to be growing nurses. And it's not a small number of increased nurses bachelor's, master's, and doctoral, but massive increases. This one's particularly challenging because there's, there's, we'd be, if we do this, not being a private university, get to charge what a private university charges for tuition and having no public investment to do this. Well, we don't quite know how to do that yet. Charge a public university tuition and produce three times the number of nurses with no public investment. We'll have to figure it out. Health observatory, what's the result? Here's some results. Number one in the U.S. for global impact, according to Times Higher Education. Number five in total research expenditures, just elected. President Robbins helped us to, to be elected into the AAU after years of being called the skunk on the porch. And so, so uh, well, you know, I've actually been sprayed by a skunk so close that the skunk spray was liquid. Yeah. <laughs> you don't ever get that off. <laughs> So, <laughs> you've been sprayed too? Yes. Yeah, that's probably how we got into these jobs. <laughs> and, so, and so, ASU excellence earns recognition. So, uh, Chris Howard is uh, on the Harvard Board of Overseer. Overseers. He's traveling all over the world. He's on a number of other boards. He's been traveling for us just back from India, uh, going with me to uh, Shanghai, Saturday morning, you're going tomorrow, but I'm going Saturday morning. Uh, and, so, and so just on this reputation thing, you've been president of two universities, 
graduate of Oxford University. Do we have any reputation for excellence out there as you've been wandering around with your new brand name attached to you? Yes. <laughs> but like what? Like what do people think? Yeah, so um, it's really wonderful because uh, President Crow has a tendency to say, ah, oh, shucks, uh, they don't know us, they don't like us, and they hate us, yeah. which is untrue, untrue, untrue. Yeah. As I cut their Achilles tendon. A hundred percent. So uh, up at Yale for the hundred sort of top leaders in higher education, the president of Amherst College, one of the, you know, the finest liberal arts colleges out there, just stops me and says, I want to tell you what you're doing at ASU is remarkably different, and it's the most important university in the world, if not, in the country, if not the world, President of Notre Dame uh, at an event, college football playoff, select college football playoff, exact same thing. Um, business leaders, the last one I'll mention is a big conference for Apollo Global Management. If you know their head of Apollo, not a big fan of university these days, but one of the things he said to us and was that Arizona State University is doing it extraordinarily well. I had the honor of speaking after the woman who, who uh, created uh, CRISPR, the Nobel Prize laureate. I went next. I got more people coming up to me asking about ASU than she had about uh, questions about CRISPR, probably because the audience didn't understand what she was saying. But and they, they, think, CRISPR's, they yeah. think CRISPR is a cereal. It's not a cereal. <laughs> <laughs> so just take a look at these excellence recognitions. I think we, we looked at these before. All of these are new. None of these were achieved before we built the new design, before the team came together, before people focused on this. Now, what's next? And I'm going to be on time. So it's not this slide. but Morgan likes to say, I got to be building 50 things at one time, or why do you have me here? <laughs> okay. So we got to design this and find a place to put this somewhere in downtown Phoenix. I don't know if it'll look like this. This was designed probably by an AI out of, AI out of somebody's iPhone, you know, but, but we got to build the headquarters for a school of medicine and advanced medical engineering. It'll probably be a, a health innovation complex, and in it will be a whole series of things. We're building this thing under construction now. We're building this thing under construction now. We're building this under construction now. This is under construction now on one of our innovation uh, campuses. This one's built, but aren't they building some new ones? Yes. Also. So how many of these will there be? Three of those. Three of these. Uh, this is under construction now on the Tempe campus as a whole new thing that we're moving forward. Uh, this is under construction now on the Tempe campus. This is under construction now as the parking structure behind those on the Tempe campus. This is under construction now on the Tempe campus. This, I walked through this this morning at about 7 o'clock. It looks like a, a weird old building. I walked through, Kenro, I walked through all the new chemistry and biochemistry labs, and some lady was like, who is this guy with a card that can go into these rooms, and what is he doing around here? I could just tell she was, like, calling the cops to turn me in, but <laughs> they didn't catch me. And so, and so uh, unbelievable undergraduate teaching labs, like nothing you have ever seen, which including our online students have to come, and they go into this building that's 50 years old or whatever it is, 60 years old, something like that, and the labs are like, like state of the art for undergraduate teaching, like nothing, and scale, multiple floors, three floors of these labs. I went through all of them. New uh, Murdoch Hall renovation. So you take old middle-class buildings, nothing fancy here, there's nothing fancy at ASU, but when you get inside our stuff, so, so Lev, what would go into a room like this just from a classroom perspective? All of these classrooms are designed not only to support innovative pedagogy inside the classroom, but they're designed actually to support what we call ASU Sync. And they're not, just a, they're not just a room. No, no, I mean, here you sort of see, uh, you know, a theater style, which is also designed to support uh, case method, and again, this is all designed through the, you know, the, the lens of the faculty members, uh, full portfolio of pedagogical approaches, but only to say that it's also fitted out with the kit to support real-time um, synchronous collaboration with anywhere in the world, as well as being able to support the recording for asynchronous use, so that can, in fact, be packaged not only for our academic uh, enterprise, but also can then be transposed for our learning enterprise through uh, transformation contents to learners all over the world. So now imagine this. So how many advanced classrooms do we have? Well, there's a total of 960 classrooms that have been completely retrofitted since COVID. So those 960 classrooms and then about 150 other rooms that we sometimes use as classrooms, conference rooms, seminar rooms, all fitted out, meaning then that we've built a university which can engage in synchronous education with people here, people not here, and asynchronous capturing all of our content, capturing everything that we're doing, making all of this happen. So the entire structure, how many people are on your team, Lev? 
Uh, there's a total of uh, 978 FTE in enterprise technology at ASU. So, and then every unit has its own little... And every unit across, all of my colleagues here, the deans, all have... What's their... the total number of IT support people that we have? Actually, one in 13 employees at university is a technology professional. It's about a total of just about 2,300 in total. Right, and so it's not like these are just people that are just running around consuming money. These are people running around helping us to be an institution that's now teaching 195,000 degree-seeking students, teaching about 500,000 learners through our learning enterprise, running high school courses across the entire world, engaged with 20-plus other universities in terms of ASU powered by across the world, all in places of material interest to the future of the United States, working on advancing the semiconductor flow, working on making certain in the humanities, in the sciences, in public policy, in the law, in all these things that we're doing where we can operate in any, in any possible way. And so that's us. We went ahead and dug up the entire historic lawn, put water tanks underneath it so that we could survive anything cost a lot of money, <laughs> but the Territorial Teachers Academy, that building in the background, that's where we started, teachers, training teachers, and we're still teachers. All of us are teachers. We are attempting to teach at multiple levels, multiple ways, multiple methods, multiple subjects, over 800 degree programs across the entire society. So, Mr. Chairman, that's my presentation. Terrific. Okay, and well done. We've got a few minutes for questions or discussion. Yes. Regents. That was exactly. It, uh, you nailed it. <laughs> Land, landed the plan on time. Because I wear diving watches with bezels on them that tell me how many. <laughs> <laughs> so questions. Questions, comments. To anyone, to the deans, to the uh, executive team. It, I, I'll go first. Um, just to say, look, it's always, this is always one of the highlights of the year. It's It's. Remarkable. Uh, congratulations to you. Great presentation. Congratulations and thank the whole team for being here uh, and for what each of you are doing. Um, a couple of things jump out. One is that um, your alignment with your mission statement is extraordinary. I mean, you are operationalizing every single word in the mission statement. Um, and you've answered, in addition to that, the question which I think has been nagging the system and NASU for at least a decade, which what is a national service university? And I think you're defining it. I mean, I, I think singularly in the United States, you are defining what that means. And as we know, because we've discussed, I mean, this was something which was actively discussed uh, in the founding documents of the United States. President Washington, in the first uh, uh, State of the Union speech that he gave in 1790, described the need for a national university. There were six attempts to do that between 1790 and 1845, all of which failed because of sectionalism and all kinds of other reasons, legitimate reasons. And so we don't need that idea now, but we do need universities that are capable of responding to national needs with great dispatch. Right. Um, so that's exciting. Obviously, I, you know, I think we can all agree that you're meeting the Don Ulrich test to how do you build a growing, successful university with diminishing state support. And, yes. and so congratulations. Uh, your alignment with the state's workforce needs, uh, clearly now becoming the largest engineering school in the country, uh, was in response you know, 20 years ago to the engineering crisis that's facing the United States, and uh, it has lent itself to the university's alignment with the workforce competitive ne needs that we've needed to create new uh, en energetic economic ecosystems that are driving Arizona's wages higher. So uh, all of that, great. And as you note, which I like to talk about every single time I'm at the legislature, at the lowest cost per degree, of any comparator in the United to, States. To the public investor, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, as you and, know, and one of the lowest in terms of just the actual cost, not just the cost to the investor. So both lowest cost and lowest cost to the public investor. Yeah. So as you know, uh, you know, much as, as your obsession with um, alternative forms of learning, my obsession is Arizona degree attainment. And, and I know that everyone in this room and everybody on your team is as focused on that. And it's the hardest nut because it is involves the, no, the widest number of things that we don't control, inputs, funding, et cetera. 
Obviously, the trajectory of Arizona Prep is great. The, you know what Maria's doing in terms of non-traditional students and all of the new learning modalities. I mean, I think you guys are doing everything you possibly can to create more products, but that number is stubborn. Mm -hmm. And so let's you know keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. We are a national service university. We are the most innovative university in the United States. All of that wonderful, but we are uh, a state-located university who has a primary obligation to crack that nut. And so I hope everyone will share the same obsession that we do. Yeah, so I, I just, so, so we're, we got the 16,000 students online attending ASU that we didn't have before from Arizona. Yep. 24,000 graduates that we wouldn't have had before without that. And then we've got the freshmen where we have the, the, the real issue, which is why we built the center with Helios, uh, working with every school district in the state was to uh, really focus on this issue of, of helping the schools and the school districts to work with all the universities to get more kids to make the right decisions to be ready to go to college or to get more students, which is why we built the Pathways program to be able to earn their way into the university um, that way. So these things all take a little while to, to have the, the pump actually deliver water. So you gotta put water in there first, which we're doing. Uh, so yes, I, that is that is very much focused on it. So Nancy, how often do you hear, hear me talk about Arizona students? Um, more than five times a week, more than every day. Yes, <laughs> yes, which makes me obnoxious, but she's very polite and and only tells me that sometimes. <laughs> yes, where's your mother? Thank you, Chair. President Crow, thank you for this amazing presentation, but I would like to also um, say to Maria, um, congratulations for all the work that you have been doing, because since we started hearing about your enterprise and the modality and the type of learners and how you are pulling all the people, all the students from all kinds of, of, of generations, I believe so, and, and the amazing work behind that. I know that it's not easy, so I just wanna come in, you know, come, just say thank you for all you do, because you're pulling exceptionally places and people from different sources, um, nationality, and this is something that, you know, will create a better state. And not, you know, not only the normal students that come to our university, but also giving the opportunity to people like your mom, you talked to me one time, people like, you know, that are trying to finish their degree or are trying to, to start. So I just wanna say congratulations. Okay. Maria gets two shout outs today. <laughs> <laughs> Regent. <laughs> yes. Okay, other comments, questions? Regent Goodyear. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to do this, but I will. Um, so the presentation is very unbelievably impressive. The thing that I've only been on the board less than two years now. If there was one event where I saw all of this come together, um, it was this past December at the Starbucks graduation. Mm -hmm. And you can see all the different piece parts of what's been designed come together to help these people. And um, it was one of the most moving experiences I've had since I've joined the board. The, all of the graduates there, uh, if they want to speak, are allowed to speak for three minutes. And the stories that they tell are just unbelievably moving. And, and these are gritty people. I mean, they want an education. I mean, people forget that being better educated is part of the American dream. And these folks would not have had an opportunity were it not for what ASU has built and what Starbucks has agreed to pay for. And I'm... Uh, I assume there will be another Starbucks <coughs> graduation in May. Each time we have a graduation, I think we're doing it in May again, there's always, there's always one, yes. I would encourage anybody who, I guess I'm inviting everyone now on your behalf, <laughs> um, but if you can go to one thing, go to that. It is impressive. It so you, you can watch me cry. Uh, <laughs> it will lift your spirits and it will make you feel really good about what this university is doing. Sure. Yeah, thank you. And, and to, our, to, our, to our deans who are all involved in building the degrees and helping to educate the Starbucks students and the, and the team, uh, thank you for those comments, Regent uh, Goodyear. It was, it was a program built on the fact that so many people that worked at Starbucks 
didn't finish college, the majority of those employees and their stories, as you heard, were, you know, my dad got cancer my freshman year, I dropped out, the university flunked me out, I couldn't get into another university, or this, or this, or this, all these things. My husband is in the Marines, and I've moved five times in the last four years, and there was no way for me to go to college. And I couldn't afford college, but I got a job at Starbucks, and I could go to college while moving with my husband supporting supporting my spouse uh, while in the Marines. These are the stories. I mean, it's really unbelievable. With real people and their parents there talking about these things from all over the country. And we have all the deans here. The what? All the deans are here sitting in the back, right? Yes, all the deans are here. All the deans. I think, which dean is missing? Let me just scan <laughs> Okay. Sun Sanjeev is here because he's usually, he's traveling a lot, but I see that he's here. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> he's on the road a lot, running an international school of management. So, uh, but yes. All right. There's two that aren't here that I can. Grasp. Other regents, comments, questions? Yes. Regent Zero goes up. If we do manage to get number one in innovation uh, for the 10th year in a row, I think it would be in the board's best interest to make limited edition rings for all of our failures. <laughs> <laughs> Just putting that out there. Regent, Regent Zaragoza, I, I will give you today a drawer full of rings that I have from our athletic victories, so many that I can cover my entire hands and feet <laughs> with these rings, and they're all laden in diamonds. <laughs> <laughs> well, they all have my name on them. I don't even know why I get them. I know I have to pay taxes because someone gave them to me, and they're just sitting in a drawer somewhere. It's, so if you want those, I, I'll give you. I'll just scrape my name off and give those to you. Uh, 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 in all seriousness, that, that's right. Today. The, the Goldwater Institute would catch us on violating the gift act. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. Another terrific performance. Thank you. Thank, Thank the you. team. Appreciate all of your hard work and successful work. Very, Thank very you. much. We've got Thank you. Yep. A uh, eight minute break and we will resume at quarter till. This is here. We need some regions. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> Unless you're voting three times, it's not enough. Okay, down one, down two, down three. It, Regent Pacheco available online? Okay. So you doing account for me? Seven. There we go. You're there. Okay. Our next item is discussion and consideration of legislation affecting the university enterprise. I'd like to welcome Thomas Atkins to discuss our alleged affairs. First time with us, isn't it, Thomas? Oh, I guess that's right. Second time. Well, welcome. I know you're in the throes of the session. Look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, uh, Chairman Deval, uh, Regents, Presidents. Uh, I'm here before you to provide a very brief update on the current legislative session. By rules that have been adopted by both the Arizona House and Senate, each session is supposed to last only 100 days. If they were to keep to this, we would be rapidly approaching the halfway point. Um, however, the 100-day rule is more of a guideline or something more akin to a New Year's resolution than a hard and fast legal requirement. And much like uh, New Year's resolutions, we don't anticipate the legislature reaching their 100-day goal. But nevertheless, um, the work progresses. Um, this is what they call swap week, where uh, the chambers are busy voting out and sending over legislation from the House of Origin over to the other chamber. Beginning next week, the committees in each house will start hearing bills from the other chamber. That process will go for about four weeks. And then the focus will shift almost exclusively to developing a state budget. Uh, before I dive into bills, I want to once again acknowledge and thank two groups. Uh, first, I want to thank the Regents for your support this session and engagement. Um, there have been multiple times this session where your engagement and on some of these issues and bills has been most impactful. Um, your relationships and expertise are a great help to me and our efforts down at the Capitol. Second, I want to acknowledge and thank the great work of the government affairs teams at each of the universities. Our board office team is very small and has a limited reach. And with the support and help of the government affairs teams at each of the universities, our reach has greatly expanded as we work to protect the interests of the board and the universities at the Capitol. So aside from the bills that I'm going to cover, 
Our top priority at the Capitol remains the state budget and preserving what remains of the key investments that the state has made. As I mentioned during our last update, the state is facing a significant budget deficit. Um, the legislature and governor are spending uh, or beginning the process to spend the next few months negotiating a budget that will likely be comprised of a combination of cuts and some use of the state's rainy day fund. I mentioned this conversation about the budget to provide some context uh, to the otherwise uh, happen bill negotiations that are happening. Um, the budget tends to color and inform all of the conversations that happen even on non-budget related items. So now onto the bills. Um, as a reminder, the board government affairs team uses the board's adopted legislative policy positions as our guiding light for engaging on legislation. These policy positions are posted on the board's website. And I additionally want to mention that the board is not running any legislation this session, but our focus is on supporting state investments in the Promise Program and the board's AZ Healthy Tomorrow initiative. Um, this, of course, this initiative, you know, will greatly expand the state's health care workforce. Uh, we once again thank Governor Hobbs for including both of these priorities in her executive budget. As I reported earlier, there have been dozens of bills impacting the public university system that have been introduced this session. I'm just going to cover some of those that are still alive and moving and some of the most notable ones. But I will refer you to the list of active bills that are before you for uh, further reading. So I'll start with the bill that was mentioned earlier, House Bill 2178. Um, this bill has been omitted from its original form and currently would allow students to select one or more student organizations to not receive the student's pro rata share of the student's fees and tuition. Um, the switch that has occurred in the bill as it was introduced was originally um, about students picking and choosing their favorites that would receive funding, and now it's more of a model of picking which clubs they don't want to receive funding. Uh, the board is registered opposed to House Bill 2178 and has been opposed from the get-go as it violates the board's uh, policy position on finance. Um, that said, the board, or excuse me, the bill does have bipartisan support, which does inform how we approach the legislation and working to address our concerns. Uh, because it has bipartisan support, uh, we are, I think, forced to explore alternative options to uh, address the bill but preserve the student government-led process as much as possible. The bill passed the House by a vote of 35 to 20 and is now awaiting a hearing in the Senate, or excuse me, in the Senate Education Committee. Uh, another bill that was mentioned has been House Bill 2735. Uh, this bill would limit the board's authority to delegate its approval of academic degrees or organizational units to only a university president who then would not be able to delegate that authority any further. The bill would further require that the board and presidents to consult rather than share responsibility with the university faculty regarding educational and faculty personnel matters. Lastly, the bill would require that the universities to provide the board with access to the university's accounting and reporting system for oversight and monitoring purposes. The bill has passed out of the House Appropriations Committee by a vote of 10 to 5, with two voting present, uh, which was notable, and is currently awaiting a floor action in the House. Senate Bill 1198, as I mentioned last time, is this year's incarnation of the Guns on Campus Bill. Like similar measures in past years, this bill would prohibit governing boards of a university, college, or community college from enacting or enforcing any policy or rule that prohibits the possession of a concealed weapon by a person who possesses a valid CCW. The bill passed on a party line vote in the Senate and awaits assignment in the House. Last year's version I'll just mention took the same path, passed out of the Senate, but uh, stalled in the House. Senate Bill 1304 is a bit of an omnibus bill uh, pertaining to ABOR in that it combines about five other bills into one. Um, for brevity's sake, I'll just focus on the provisions of note that we are most concerned with on 1304 that are also outlined in a couple other bills. Um, specifically, we are concerned about the possible infringement on intellectual property of instructors, and we're also concerned about um, limiting universities' abilities, the, the ability of universities to adequately supervise and direct the work of employees who speak on behalf of the universities. Uh, Senate Bill 1304 is passed out of the Judiciary Committee on a party line vote and is also awaiting action uh, on the floor. 
Senate Bill 1409 would uh, extend eligibility for the spouses of military veterans tuition scholarship to students at private post-secondary institutions. Um, it's notable that this uh, proposal contrasts with the governor's uh, proposal to use existing capacity in the scholarship to fund other underfunded programs, including the Promise Program. The bill passed out of the Senate Military Affairs and Public Safety Committee and is awaiting action in the floor. Uh, some action took place today on Senate Bill 1477. This is an interesting bill that would require, or actually would create a whole new department within the Board of Regents, a, a department called the Grade Challenge Department that would uh, be tasked with hearing the complaints of students who were awarded grades that they felt were awarded because of a political bias. Um, aside from the fact that this bill uh, sets aside a very robust academic grievance process that currently exists at all three universities, um, this will also create an unfunded mandate for the board to staff uh, and manage satellite offices at each of the universities. Um, it was touch and go on the floor today where for a moment the bill uh, did not have enough support but one vote flipped. So the bill passed out on a party line vote out of the Senate is now over, headed over to the House. We'll continue our work on that. So in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and conclude my briefing here, but I will refer you to the bill list in front of you for further information. I'm happy to take any additional questions. Well, thank you, Thomas. Uh, you know, the first one that j just jumps out at me is, is putting a 1477 and a grade appellate process together with guns on campus strikes me as a really, really bad combination of ideas. Just get with that. Okay. Yeah. Challenging. All right, comments, questions from Regents? Hmm? Okay, very good. All right, Thomas, well done. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Uh, okay, moving on to administrative business. Um, our next item is a continuation from the University Governance and Operations Committee discussion on financial policy revisions and financial monitoring enhancements. The board is asked to review on first reading proposed revision to ABOR policy 3-407, financial status updates, and new ABOR policies 3-407.01, business process review, and 3-407.02, principles for university financial management and repealing the guidelines for liquidity measures. That is a lot of verbiage to say we need better tools at this board to monitor the success and financial sustainability of our institutions. But Brad, would you please walk us through this item? Thank you, Regent DeVal. Good afternoon, Regents and Presidents. Uh, so as a reminder, last fall, there were some fairly significant financial uh, issues determined through or identified through the board's financial oversight processes at the University of Arizona related to cash balances. So the board took immediate action to work to uh, start stabilizing the university and come up with a management plan to deal with that. But at the same time, at the December special board meeting, directed board staff to provide a thorough review of existing financial structures and policies in order to come up with ways to give the board uh, more insights and earlier tools to detect irregularities at the universities. So in order to do that, we've reviewed those things and at the January committee meeting of the University Governance and Operations Committee presented a roadmap of how some of our policies might begin to be evolved in order to make that work. Now, given that this is uh, of significant importance, we've moved that uh, timeline forward and are presenting at first read today some of those policies that we've been working with the universities on and have uh, refined a little bit from the original roadmap. Um, as such, the regents would be waiving under policy 1-111, the formal committee review, in order to have that first read here today so that we can move forward for final review at the April board meeting cycle and get this into place as quickly as possible. So by way of summary, there's a couple of key kind of top line changes that are reflected in the detailed policies in your materials. The first is that we're proposing a new policy that lays out principles for the types of management controls that are expected at each of the universities. The second piece are updates to our existing quarterly financial reporting to make that uh, practice a little bit more robust with additional financial data to add trends and comparisons that would be useful to understanding that data and to emphasize that those reports will be done quarterly or more frequently as uh, directed by the board and the executive director. 
Uh, this is one particular area where we are concurrently working with Regent Mata and formerly Regent Herbold uh, and the university teams to develop tools that use the infrastructure that the university has in order to provide the best uh, and most useful information for the regents in those reports. So as a result of that, we're going to continue those conversations and there may be some adjustments to the final language when we come to you for a final read in April. Uh, thirdly, we are emphasizing the liquidity requirements that is in the board's current liquidity guidelines by rescinding the guideline and actually creating a formal liquidity policy. And that, uh, by way of reminder, is the daily cash on hand policy, which was used to identify some of these issues at U of A. And then lastly, we're uh, proposing a new policy to reinforce best practices and quality assurance in university financial management. And that will include both an annual gathering of CFO teams between the three universities and the board office to talk about hot button issues, to share best practices, and to survey strategies uh, to move ahead. And uh, also a triannual peer review process where the universities go into each other's shops and work with the teams to review their documentation and make recommendations on ways to improve the practices that are in place at the universities, uh, one university per year moving forward. So with that, uh, all of these materials are in front of you. I'll welcome any questions that you have. Great. Questions, comments from the board? Here's your mother. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Brad. And I want to thank all the CFO that has been working, you know, with the group and this committee to make sure that we have a stronger, you know, oversight and all the input and the way that we can consolidate or have a better data, financial data to look at at any in any region can always you know look at those documentations and any questions that could be uh, arise um, since we have this situation in you know in fall in the fall and at the, I want to thank you too because this is this has been requiring a lot of um, delegation input um, revision and and thank you all so especially our CFOs in the back you know and uh, I know that um, it's, it's been a lot of conversations and our couple of meetings, so we, we expect to move forward and have a stronger, you know, oversight. Thank you. Thank you. The comments, questions? Okay, seeing none. Thank you, Brad. Um, we, this is first reading. They'll be brought back to the board, as was said, for a second reading and approval at the April board meeting. Next on our agenda is a uh, review of the FY 2023 year-end annual financial reviews prepared by the universities, audited June 30th. Um, and these are the 23 annual comprehensive financial reports. Uh, Brad will be leading us off with an introduction to the report followed by a discussion led by each of the university CFOs regarding their metrics. So you, John's going to present wearing, yeah. it, wearing his other hat. I think I'm going first. Okay. <laughs> regarding metrics and address any other questions from the board. The, um, uh, I have it in my notes. Uh, the, following Brad's introduction, the order will be Morgan Olson from ASU, Bjorn Flugstead from NAU, and John Arnold from U Arizona. So there you go. That's wrong. Yeah, that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> we should go there too. <laughs> yeah. Brad, you have the floor. Thank you, Regent Deval. Regents again. Uh, so while we were just talking about what we're going to do with policies moving forward, we are now revisiting the policies we have in place right now. So in those policies, there are some annual financial reporting requirements that come off of the fall annual financial statements that the universities publish. So those were published back in October, November. Now that we've had the opportunity to look through them, we typically present that information in January. But just given everything that's going on financially, we thought that it better to delay that and have that here at this meeting so that we can raise its importance and kind of recover what's actually in that report with a little bit more detail. So I'm going to take a few minutes to walk through the metrics that are in here. Please bear with me and thank you for pretending to <laughs> not to be bored as I talk through the metrics. However, the riveting part will come when the university CFOs have the opportunity to talk through the actual data for their schools. So by way of review, uh, again, the universities and NABOR have lots of different metrics that we look at that speak to both mission and financial health. And this is the stuff that falls in the realm of financial health where we're specifically asking the kinds of questions that credit agencies and other external evaluators look at to understand at a very high level how healthy the university are, how resilient the universities are, and whether or not they can withstand the, the types of things that come up in the, the economy and so forth. So there's some, some basic questions that you see there about what's happening with uh, revenue and expenditures, what's happening with the demand that drives those revenues, 
and whether the universities have sufficient resources in order to manage the obligations that are put on them at any point in time. So we're going to walk through some of those metrics. Uh, and each of them are really, I would group them into revenue and expenditure trends, financial health and resiliency metrics, as well as that student demand uh, that drives revenue moving forward. So we're going to briefly walk through what each of these metrics means and then ask the universities to discuss their data. So the first metric here is the state general fund as a percentage of total revenue, as it describes. This measures the university's rep uh, dependence on state public dollars in order to operate. The converse of this is that it also represents the amount of money that we are not getting from government funding and therefore need to be generated through tuition fees and other, other resources. So as you can see here, system-wide, uh, Arizona universities are at 14% of their uh, overall revenues as public funding, and there's some variation between the universities reflective of, of size and scope. Uh, the next piece of that, sort of related, is dependence on tuition and fees. So while that first metric can be seen as an, a measure of both commitment and risk as it relates to public funding, this is the other side where some of that revenue needs to come from tuition and fees versus other sources, and the risk that is associated with the actual demand by students to enroll at the university and pay those tuition and fees. So two different major pressures that need to be managed as it relates to the revenue side of the equation. So then we move into uh, the expenditure side. So while expenditures are generally limited to the revenue that the institution gets, um, it is important to kind of track what the core cost pressures are. So we use education in general expenditure or expenses as a general measure of those kind of core day-to-day -day teaching and learning expenses. It excludes things like auxiliaries and kind of the side revenues and really focuses on, on that core so that as you look at it, especially in the context of revenue trends, you get a sense of how cost pressures are lining up with the ability of the university to deliver services. Then move to some of those resiliency and health metrics. So this is spendable cash and investments as a percentage of operating expenses. The idea of this metric is it's the university's ability to meet expenses without new income. And while we would never want the university to have to pay all its expenses without new income, what it does is it just gives us a a ratio that gives us a sense of how resilient the university is and what kind of interruptions in its business cycle that it could absorb. So this metric is measured on a scale of zero to one, zero to one with one being 100% of annual expenses covered with current cash. Uh, and the median for public universities nationally is 0.83, so 83%. So similar, uh, we are talking about operating margin ratio. Uh, this in the private sector would be thought of as like profitability. This is the degree to which revenues and expenditures, or to the, the degree to which expenditures fall below revenues. So how much money is it being added or subtracted from that position uh, year to year? Again, it's a signal of strength. It's a signal of the ability to uh, weather economic downturns. And it allow, you know, more profitability in that sense allows for lower tuition, better mission attainment, and so forth. <laughs> Uh, daily cash on hand, a metric that you all have heard a lot about over the last several months. So this is another metric that is meant to reflect the university's resiliency and, and the ability to navigate financial downturns. Uh, so this is effectively the amount of cash as a percentage of operating expenses, but it's expressed as a number of days that the university can continue operations. Uh, so ABOR has a standard here that we just proposed moving from guidelines to formal policy that it falls within national uh, norms. Right now, those metrics as computed by Moody's are 140 to 234 days of cash expenditures, and the national median uh, for public universities is 187 days. Uh, we have a debt service coverage ratio. So this, again, is another angle of what can the university do if everything else uh, or to be frozen. In this context, though, it's about the university's debt obligation. So how, how well are we able to pay for the things that we owe over the longer period of time? This, again, is a ratio up to 100% one. Or, I mean, it extends beyond one, but one is 100%, which is viewed as the minimum threshold for acceptability. The national median is 3.5. Our universities all are above that minimum 1.0 level there meaning that there's not a lot of particular risk at the moment that we can't meet our debt obligations. And then I'll take the last two together, because this is really 
how selective the university is in terms of admitting students, and then how many of those students matriculate. And taking those two metrics together, it gives us a sense of what the demand for the university is versus the capacity for additional growth. So those two things play together. Lower selectivity and higher yield mean that there's a level of demand for the university services. Higher selectivity and lower yield means that there's capacity for growth there that can be taken advantage of. Both of those pieces are useful in understanding uh, and evaluating the relative risk as it ties to our dependence on tuition as a major driver of revenue. So with that, with that said, I will pause there for any questions on what the metrics mean, but also would, and Dr. Crow has a comment. Yeah. Sorry, Dave, sorry, I have a question on the last one. Mm -hmm. Please, go ahead. So on the concept of high selectivity, so, so when you have an institution which is designed to not have high selectivity because you believe that it's contrary to the democratic principles of the republic in which we live for, a, for an institution, so the fact that that's a measure gets my attention. So we will have over 80,000 applicants to our freshman class. The vast majority of them will meet our qualifications because they know what our qualifications are. Uh, and, and we will attempt to yield from them uh, the best class that we possibly can. And so perhaps we can talk about it offline. It's just that you have a measure up there that's contrary to our purpose. Yep. No, I, I agree with you, uh, Dr. Crow. And I think the way that this is set up is that they're presented because these are things that other folks look at. But I think through any of these measures, there's context that's super important. And as we look at some of the numbers around things like cash on hand and whatnot, some of those metrics tie to things that are different about our design relative to others. So we talk about public support. We talk about uh, how big endowments are versus other types of older and different institutions. All of those things sort of temper what our university's metrics are. But I think it makes sense that, again, there are these measures that you could look at impartially, but that doesn't mean that we necessarily want to maximize that. No, but in our, in our not to belabor the point, but in our, and Morgan can speak on this, in our bond rating meetings with those that are attempting to calculate our financial mm -hmm. position and thus give us a credit rating relative to our debt acquisitions, you know, this notion of 80,000 people wanting to be in our freshman class is non-trivial. Uh, and the notion of our enrollment growth and so forth and so on. And so I, I just want to make sure that we don't use something that creates a false picture because uh, if, if selectivity is an indicator of, of success, then you know, we wouldn't be able to scale. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do the core mission. And so I just, it just sort of got my attention. Brad, you about to kick it off to colleagues? Absolutely. Okay. So without further ado, uh, I'll turn it over to John Arnold first in his capacity of U of A and as well as to oh, provide this, some. Oh, somebody <laughs> just fixed the slide. I like that. <laughs> That's agility. Well done. So I, I think I have some slides somewhere. Hey, there they are. Hmm. Thanks, Brad. Um, Thank you, Regents. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the financial <laughs> position of the University of Arizona and give a little bit of public update. Um, again, this, this uh, discussion today is spurred by the release of the fiscal 2023 financial statements. So it's really a look back on fiscal 23, not really an update on where we're at in 24, but we can talk about that a little bit. If you like, Brad, Brad was kind. I, I asked that this discussion be postponed out of the committee day to today because I frankly wasn't ready. And so I, I appreciated the accommodation to, to get to where we are today. So fiscal 23, uh, the, the University of Arizona's uh, cash position changed by a negative $140 million. Uh, we went back and reconciled you know exactly what happened in, in fiscal 23. We started the year with $845 million in cash. Um, the university overspent, uh, and um, we broke that down by colleges and divisions. Uh, so there's 80 colleges and divisions out there exclusive of athletics. With athletics, there's 81, which we talk about a lot. Athletics lost $32 million in fiscal 23. Uh, the university in invested $15 million in their strategic plan, which was the, the fourth year of that investment, which was planned and, and was budgeted. Um, there's uh, some unallocated costs that sit at the center of the university. This is largely some utilities, some leases, some other institutional costs that uh, have not been allocated out to any of the budget units. 
and have been paid for out of cash reserves over the years. That was $26 million. There happened to be a 27th payroll. It's typically 26 payrolls in a given uh, fiscal year in fiscal uh, 23. That hit the university for $35 million. Uh, we deferred payroll taxes during COVID and the federal government wanted their money back and so we had to pay that $18 million and then we, the University of Arizona acquired UAGC on uh, June 30th and they came in with $47 million in cash which offset some of those losses so we ended up with a $140 million net change which left us with $705 million at the end of the year. Um, since I've been down at the University of Arizona, a number of people ask, have asked me, uh, why didn't I see the financial problems at the university coming? What, what, you know, what, how did you miss this? And, I, and I've thought about that a lot. And so what I, what I thought I would do as we walk through these metrics today is to look back. So we're looking at 2023, but luckily Brad gave us five years. So I thought we'd look back at 2022 to see what indicators are in there and, and really, you know, we have a case study in front of us. Are these an effective use of metrics? So I, I want to walk through and look at 22, look at 23. What Were there clues in there and is there a better way or there a better set of metrics we should be looking at and, and just hint, I think that there probably are. Um, so first, uh, monthly days cash on hand, this is you know, Brad had it lower in the, the, the dashboard and, and, this, and just we, we've used the same set of metrics for years. Um, so just put that on the table. Um, I, I, but I put it up on top because I think the board really understands what day's cash on hand means, where it comes from, um, and, and what it's supposed to indicate. So you can see in 2021, uh, day's cash on hand was really, really high, $173 million, a huge increase out of 2020. But, but there was a significant drop between 2021 and 2022. Um, that drop between 175 days to 149, 173 days to 149 um, was worth about $45 million in cash. That's so the university's cash position dropped about 45 million in 2022. Um, but 2021, and, and we understood this last year when we looked at this number was artificially high. I think all three universities will show a, a high number for 2021. Um, you know, uh, the day's cash on hand is a, is a ratio between cash and, and your annual expenditures. 2021 uh, annual expenditures were suppressed because of COVID for a number of reasons. We deferred payroll taxes. We actually took a debt holiday in fiscal 21. We, um, um, some of the expenditures <coughs> in 2020 were reimbursed in 2021 as some of the COVID dollars came in from the federal government and it just lowered our overall operating costs, <coughs> which drove up that day's cash on hand number. So when the board office looked at this last year, we just, I should say I looked at that and went, well, that's, that's noise in the system because of COVID and also we knew that the university was in the middle of the the strategic plan had planned to, to, to invest some of those dollars. So we weren't alarmed by it. In retrospect, we probably should have understood a little bit better what was going on between fiscal 21 and fiscal 22. Um, total revenue by source is another metric we use. If you look across there, you know, you know, relatively flat revenue growth between 19 and 21. Again, COVID impacts in there. 2022, it looks like we're coming out of there. And even if you look at fiscal 23, where we know there were significant problems, it looks great. Um, solid growth in revenue. We'll come back to this in, in a little bit. Uh, gross net tuition and fees, so you take that, that revenue uh, chart and look specifically at, at tuition and fees. Again, same pattern. Um, you know, 2019, 2021 relatively flat, but, but growth coming out of that in 22 and 23. Uh, perhaps what should have been alarming to us in this chart is the, the scholarship allowance as a percentage of growth tuition, gross tuition and fee. We see that climb from 26% up to 33% in 2022 and then 34% in 
three, um, which suggests that that our per student revenue is likely not growing as quickly as total revenues. That this these revenue charts that we're looking at is a function of, of overall growth, but not profitability. Uh, university net position, um, Morgan did a great job talking about net position earlier as they showed that 20, I think 22 year history of net position at the university and I think that's a great way to look at net position. Um, this is really a measure of the total assets at the university including capital assets and, and measures the, the financial health of the university over a long period of time. Um, as one of our financial people people put it to me, this is not going to catch a curve in the road. Um, you know, this th th this is a, the development of an asset base over many, many years. And while the University of Arizona continued to grow in its total assets, um, you know, we had the operating problem on the other side. So a, I think a good measure, but we, we need to understand what it's really looking at. Uh, unrestricted net position. So this is a, a subset of the prior slide where they take out capital, we take out uh, restricted dollars, um, and it's it, it's really our first measure of liquidity. Um, and again, you can see in here between 21 and 22, we saw a drop of, of uh, unrestricted assets. And, and that should have raised some alarm bells for us uh, as we look at that um, in 2022. And again, you know, we're coming out of COVID knew the university was spending uh, purposely some of their cash, um, but, but should have looked at that and said, okay, we need to understand this a little bit better. Why, why that change? Uh, student enrollment, from really from, uh, you look at this, it looks beautiful. Um, total enrollment's growing, uh, non-resident enrollment growing, um, online enrollment growing. So, so you know, really what you would want out of an enrollment chart. Uh, e and G per FTE. So this is this is uh, our the cost side. And again, you see that suppression during 21 and 22. Great, our costs are flat, down slightly. Um, so it, in 2022, that would look great. 2023, you see that that spike. You know, we're up 10% in costs, um, but didn't. Didn't know that was coming yet, um, but but note here how we're presenting cost is on a per student basis. Everything we've done on the revenue side is on the university basis, and so we we haven't in these metrics really drawn a good comparison other than some of the liquidity measures between revenue and cost. Um, so yeah, total gross revenues, university wide revenues up. But then we'll start looking at cost only on the, the student level basis. And that, I think that caused us to miss some of what was going on inside of the university. Uh, spendable cash investment to operating expense ratio. So again, this is a liquidity measure. Um, it comes out of Moody's um, and, it, and it looks in many ways similar to day's cash on hand. Um, I've had a team of people trying to explain to me why the number went up in 2022 <laughs> when day's cash on hand went down in 2022. And, and I don't know if Morgan Bjorn can help because I still don't know the answer to that other than it's definitional is what I keep hearing. And the term operating expenses is... Um, it's a difficult calculation. You start with GASB and then Moody's makes a whole bunch of changes to it and it kicks out something that, that appears to me to not have been a very good measure for where the university was at in 2022. Would the operating expenses be reduced as the denominator of that by the payroll, payroll taxes we didn't pay? But that was in 21. It's 22. All of that expense was back. And so should have... We, yeah, I don't know. and that's, they, they've sent me the calculation, so um, one we may want to look at is this really an effective uh, metric for the board. Does it mean anything? Is, the, is this really going to tell us what we're looking to, to learn? 
Uh, operating margin ratio, uh, similar issue. Um, again, you see that spike in 2022. Um, not, not a clear understanding to me what's what's really going on here. And again, I think you have a lot of definite definitional issues in there that that may not be telling us what we're looking to learn from these measures. Uh, debt service coverage ratio. Similar issue, and I think it's really driven by by the the prior two, um, where there's certain definitions. This again is a Moody's calculation that uh, it certainly means something to them. I don't know that it means to the board what we want it to mean, and we may want to revisit you know, what what this is supposed to tell us. Picking up 2023 and all of these, you see the decline in 2023, which you would expect. But but why we're showing such levels of health in 2022 uh, surprised me. So I guess my assumption would be that those Moody's ratios are incredibly technically defined. Mm -hmm. And so that we're not getting a real picture of what the operations are. And, you know, while it's nice to have Moody's and they are obviously, you know, a piece of the equation in terms of how the bond market looks at us and everything else, they're probably not necessarily the best way for us to look at this. Well, and just in terms of for the purposes of the Board of Regents, you know, can we, I think we need to identify some metrics that the board can clearly understand mm -hmm. what what's going on inside of that metric. You know, and, and even days cash on hand, which I think we all feel pretty comfortable with, yeah. There was, there was enough noise in 2022 and 2021 that I, I don't know that the picture we was, would have seen it was anyway. as clear as it, it could be. Well, John, the basis points, what, you know, what does that extrapolate? I mean, back to, yeah, it's directionally up or down, but yeah. what does a basis point mean relative to actual cash? I mean, those, there's some back things yeah, so. we would have to learn to say, hey, I get where that is. So theoretically, it means we have two and a half times in operating um, revenue to, than, than we do versus our debt service requirements. Um, but again, there's there's definitions of operating. That, What's in there? Right. That, and and again, I'm not the expert in this stuff, and Morgan Bjorn will probably be able to help the board understand a little bit better than I can. That's fine. But, it, but why it shows up, why do we see that improvement between 21 and 22? versus days cash on hand between 21 and 22, which is the opposite direction. And and the reality on the ground was the opposite direction in, in many ways. And it, you know, uh, enrollment selectivity and matriculation, you know, I just threw these all onto one slide because they're they're really measuring something different than the, the health of the university. And, and, you know, all of these measures are relatively stable for the University of Arizona, some slight declines. Um, in the last couple of years. Um, so anyway, that that's a review of, of the metrics. Um, there's, I, I wanted, I put this slide in here because um, last November, uh, the university provided a, a, a forecast on UAGC operations, and I just wanted to update that forecast. Um, the, the revenue and the, at that meeting in November, UAGC was forecasting about an $18 million operating loss. Um, I've gone over that forecast with the CFO of UAGC. It was a conservative forecast. Uh, since uh, they've come into the university and they've been, been working with, with one another, they've identified uh, a number of efficiencies that's brought that $18 million operating loss down to about $2 million in operating loss. Uh, the biggest savings there is, if, is efficiencies we've helped them to find in uh, matriculating students in, into their system. But they've also reduced total employee headcount and, and a couple of other things. Uh, so their, their uh, total revenue, current forecast in revenue is 229, about $230 million. Uh, their operating expenses is 232, uh, so expecting a net loss this year of of $3.4 million, um, $2.4 million, I'm sorry. Uh, their current forecast for next year is, is 3.1 positive. We hope to significantly uh, beat that number next year. So anyway, there's um, 
just because that that forecast has changed so much since the November meeting, I wanted to update the board on where we were at. Can I, Joe, can I just add yeah, something very quickly? Is that you know, when you acquire an organization, there is always a year of just dust in the air. <laughs> and so the fact that they've actually been able to wrangle a $18 million loss into a $2.4 million loss um, is a significant improvement. And I think um, anybody who's been involved in a merger is aware that there's a lot that doesn't come to, to, you know, to people's awareness until you actually get boots on the ground and are looking at things together. And so, um, you know, while it is a, a slight loss in operations for this year, the fact that it's turned around positive for 2025 and that they have managed to reduce that loss significantly is, is a very good indication. We, we have, uh, we engaged Ernst & Young to come in, uh, really take a hard look at UAGC, including their financial numbers. So we want to make sure everything is 100% is accurate and transparent. Um, and then give us some advice on how we, we move forward with that, um, continue to bring them into the university operations uh, to gain as much efficiency as we can. So we had our kickoff meeting earlier this week with Ian Y and, and uh, so that, that work is progressing and we should have reports from them in the next few weeks. Thank you. John, you have a question? Sure. So as we bring UAGC and like um, Bridget Nansen said, with the mergers, so the GNA on overhead can be pulled from them to us, to U of A, so that will flat their expenses? Could, could that happen? Uh, Mr. Chair, Regent Mata, um, so the, the, the question we're really exploring is, you know, UAGC came in as a fully realized university doing all the things a fully realized university largely does. University of Arizona is a fully realized university, and so you can imagine there's overlap yeah. in a lot of areas between those two. You know, you have two accounting offices, two HR offices, two IT offices, et cetera, et cetera. And long term, we, we just don't need two of everything. Um, there are some areas UAGC operates on a very different platform. They're not a semester system. They're in a series of continual starts throughout the course of the year. And so there, there are some things they're going to have to do independently of the university. Um, but uh, many things I think we can consolidate and, and gain efficiencies as we bring these two institutions together. Thank you. Yeah. I follow up. Can you go back to the slide that has the Six or seven major deficit categories. Oh, sure. That's my and first question. One. Yep. <clears throat> Oops. Yep, that was it. So going forward, I don't want to do a full dive into next year yet, but going forward, we're not going to have the $35 million on the 27th payroll. No. We're not going to have the $18 million on on the CARES Act. No. Um, so and yet you have shared with the U of A community in the budget briefing that actually the projected deficit for next year goes up. Mm -hmm. And that, so that we're clear, and that is become, because with those off the table, with the strategic plan funding diminishing quickly, with a new athletic director who is seeking to make rapid progress on the athletic piece, that the driver of next year's growth of the deficit is in the college and divisions. Well, thank you. Thank you, Chair. A couple of things. The, the other thing that drops off is $47 million in positive um, yes. cash acquisition. Yes. So if you remove that number, they were at $187 million mm -hmm. loss from, from university activities. Um, so we're, we're down from that this year. And hopefully, you know, the 177 was our forecast in December um, before we really started any mitigation. Issues. So we're hoping to be down from that 177. Right. Uh, we are still projecting an athletics loss of around 30 million dollars. Uh, the strategic plan, I think, is down to about five. Mm -hmm. The unallocated leases and utilities, that's still sitting there, around 27 million. But the the real growth is in the colleges and divisions. So I, I think the number there is 116 million dollars this year, um, and and that's largely in personnel costs as as um, universities grappled with uh, inflation and we've added a number of new students between 22 and 23 mm -hmm. you know we saw growth in in the student body and we added faculty and staff to to appropriately to address that growth um, unfortunately a lot of those students came at a flat 
uh, revenue per student. So the revenue didn't come with those students that we needed to deal with the escalation of costs. Okay. Got it. And so we can't get there without unwinding that number. Yeah, and we, ne we need to take yeah. some costs out of the universities. It suggests we need to bend the cost curve. Unfortunately, right. you know, the, the university is still in a strong cash position. We'd like it to be stronger, and we will work towards uh, making it stronger. But we're in a position, you know, and that, this is the reason why universities have cash reserves, and so they can self-finance through hiccups. And uh, hiccups is probably a, a not a strong enough word. Uh, bumps in the financial uh, cycles and life cycles of an institution. Mm -hmm. okay. Other comments, questions with John? All right, thank you. Brad, over to you or to Morgan. All right. uh, so uh, my gift to the board is I have no slides. <laughs> I think <laughs> extra credit. Probably had enough ASU slides today, but I, I'll make just a couple of comments about uh, our financial trends, and then maybe talk a little bit about what I think is probably the, the bigger issue on the table, and that is, you know, how do we make sure that we're doing this well, keeping our institutions financially healthy and sustainable, etc. Uh, so. Uh, the main thing I'd want to tell the board at this point is that Arizona State University is financially healthy. And I think the data that you have in your report reflect that. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, our net position, uh, net assets, if you will, over the last five years, which are included in the, in the uh, report, uh, the net position has increased about 55% to about $2.1 billion. Uh, it happened, the number happened to be the increase in net position last year, 23, happened to be about $190 million. But I really uh, like to look at, you know, multi-year data, more than just one-year inflection points, because I think it gives you a clearer picture, particularly when you have the time series that we have here. You know, the pandemic and everything that went with it, including a, uh, you know, substantial influx of one-time dollars into our budgets, a lot of the, you have to understand that and what it means as it flows through and what your strategy was. And so looking at multi, a multi-year time series, I think, is a lot more helpful. Um, our, our unrestricted net, which arguably in accountant speak is, is the money that you could make management decisions around that have no uh, requirements for their use, et cetera, uh, over the last, uh, over the time period of this report, uh, increased more than three and a half fold. Uh, at ASU to about $580 million, which again, I think is a sign of uh, financial health overall. Uh, operating margin is another one that we tend to look at. Uh, you know, what's, what's your revenue and expense uh, basis? Uh, and that's a gap or accounting basis, which is sometimes a little different than, you know, budgeted figures. So we put a lot of energy, and I drive some of my colleagues crazy about, okay, well, I see what, you know, our cash is here, but what's that going to look like? when we put in all the end of the year accounting entries, which actually is the basis on which a lot of these metrics are calculated and what rating agencies and other folks look like. And we've done some simulations where, you know, several hundred million dollar changes between a, a cash uh, sort of a report and then a, and then a gap report, not uncommon. And, and so you better understand what's happening as you go through. And we're all big, complex organizations, and so those are material uh, uh, issues. Um, our our operating margin in, in, in the last several years has you know, ranged between 2.7% and 5.9%. 5.9% uh, happened to be fiscal year 2023. I would tell you not to expect that margin next year because of a lot of the one-time money that's going away. And part of our financial strategy was that we didn't simply cut everybody a check when all that federal money came in. We got a little bit of a criticism for that. I'm here to tell you I'm really glad that we did that. And, and if you looked at some of the charts that President Crow showed earlier, there was a little slice of those bar charts that reflected the federal money, and you will see that that populated about four or maybe even five years. And that's been critical to our ability to sort of you know manage some of the volatility that we've all experienced over the last five years or so. Uh, I would expect that probably our, our number is going to be more like 4% uh, at the end of this fiscal year. A lot of that has had to do with our ability to continue to generate uh, increases in enrollment, critically important to us. And we spend a lot of time 
focused on that. About half of our revenue in terms of our operating budget comes from net tuition and fees revenue. Uh, President Crow's indicated a number of times it's really you know, more of a private university model, and it is. That, that's, that's correct. I, I would suggest it's, it's a uh, private university model for a university that doesn't have a huge endowment relative to its scale. And is not allowed to charge market price for its tuition. Egg, exactly. And so, so, you know, it's a very interesting calculus and, and meeting, you know, meeting our, our charter, uh, you, you know, is, is a part of that as well. And so, you know, the net price information that you saw for our students is, is key to that. But we've been successful in generating enrollment increases, 23% uh, increase over the time period of this uh, multi-year report to 127,000 plus full-time equivalent students. We've also been successful in being able to generate positive net tuition revenue per FTE student. And I, I, I know in my discussions with John, that's one thing that the University of Arizona is definitely working on. We've done, also been able to manage the cost side. Uh, our ENG costs over this time period per full-time equivalent student uh, have increased by 9%. That's total. And that, you know, there's two sides to that coin. You know, so the one side is, yeah, if you look at that from a financial standpoint, you know, managing costs in a, a very accountable way, you say, you know, that's good. On the other hand, though, you have to have the resources to be able to deliver at a high level of quality. If you don't do that, it doesn't matter how little you spend. And so it's balancing cost and quality. And, you know, President Crow's report showed a lot of the indicators of quality and, and how they're improving. You know, can we do better? Sure. Uh, if we had more money to spend, could we do better? Sure. But I think we've done a reasonably good job of balancing those, those factors. Um, I would also say, you know, we do watch monthly days cash on hand, uh, and that consistently for ASU remains sort of in the middle of, of the board's range that it's established. I will tell you that's a, you know, it is not as straightforward of a calculation as it looks. So, for example, uh, you know, our, ours is trending down just a little bit, and there are a lot of technical factors that are involved. So, for example, uh, we have a quasi-endowment that we established because we don't need, uh, you know, on a, on a near-term basis all the liquidity. So we would like to increase the return on assets that we have, and part of doing that was we invested in some less liquid investments. In other words, something that is not liquid in one month, which is the test that, that uh, Moody's uses in that calculation. So that actually reduced our monthly days cash on hand. But it doesn't mean we're, we're less rich. In fact, I'd argue if things work the way we think and hope that they will, we'll actually be richer over time. Um, so I guess what I, you know, part of, part of what I would say is, is that, uh, you know, finding the right or the perfect metric is a little bit like the search for the Holy Grail. It probably isn't over yet, and I'm not sure that it ever will uh, be over. Um, what we spend a little bit more time on is uh, where we think things are going. So, some of you know I like hockey just a little bit as a, as a sport, and, and some of you have talked about uh, you know, one of the best hockey players that's ever played the game, Wayne Gretzky. Why was he so good? Well, because he could anticipate where the puck is going to be, not where it is right now. And we try to do that a little bit with what we're doing. We try to figure out, okay, where are things going next, not where they were a year ago or even today, but where they're going. And I, and I think... You know, the secret to being able to do this well, and we aren't always, by the way, uh, is, is to try to anticipate you know, where the university is going on some of these complex factors that, that have interactive mechanisms to them. And, and so um, you know, this may be uh, you know, a little bit uh, radical. I, I've, I've kind of said as we've had some of our discussions, it's important to have metrics that are helpful, but you know, don't uh, beat your brains out trying to find the perfect metrics. I would, I would suggest to you that you could probably, and I think John did a good job of this actually, uh, you know, you could see some of the signs in terms of some of the challenges that we've had and, uh, you know, trying, spending time on where we're going and the strategy that will allow you to actually achieve that is, is I think, what's really important. So in our case, you know, what we're going to be focusing on for the next couple of years, this is probably where President Crow wakes up, wondering what I'm going to say, uh, is, Crow yeah, I figured, uh, you know, we have some really heady goals you know, that, that the board and, and President Crow have laid out for us. It's going to take a lot to achieve those, and you know, that's sort of job one. In fact, I kind of you know, perceive our job in the financial area 
is figuring out how to provide the resources to make those things happen. And so in doing that, some of the things that we're watching is, you know, we need to continue to have healthy enrollment. That's, you know, if that, uh, you know, if the music stopped on that, somebody's going to get left without a chair. And you know, we don't want to be the one left without a chair, obviously. We also need to make sure that we have net tuition growth. It's not enough just to have more FTE or headcount students. There has to be growth in net tuition revenue to accomplish some of these things. So that's an important metric for us. And then the other thing I think that we know and we see coming up here is that uh, you know we were fortunate enough to receive, uh, if we include this year, over half a billion dollars in one-time money from the federal government around the pandemic and the support that was provided. It's tremendously important, you know, to uh, uh, the maintenance of, of our university's abilities to do what they need to do for our students. Tremendously important for many, many of our students to be able to continue to, you know, seek a higher education. Well, guess what? That was all one-time money, and we knew that going in, but it's still a lot of money to figure out how to gain with organic growth in a time period. You heard the report, the legislative report earlier. You know, people who think that uh, we're going to get a big increase in state investment are probably whistling Dixie, and so, you know, that we got to assume that parameter now. How are we going to do that and how are we going to make it all work? So probably enough from me, but if there are any questions, comments, uh, I'm happy to have them. Thanks very much. Not seeing any, I'm slipping behind, so thank you for a terrific report. Gern? Chair Duvall, members of the board, uh, no slides from me either. Uh, so we'll just go uh, <laughs> right into a few comments. And again, throwing you under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Looking back again, this is you know going back in time, retrospective to 2023. Uh, the the measures that you see uh, on the slides and that Brad walked through really uh, do reflect a strong uh, financial position for for NAU. Uh, looking back in time, I think you know to the points about you know can we find additional measures? Absolutely, and there's a lot of different uh, distinctions uh, within some of these measures. One-time funding. What, what were those one-time funds spent on? Did they, how did they impact a current year's expenditures or cash level? I think that that uh, comes out through some of the slides that uh, you were seeing. I think we also have to be thinking about, even as was pointed out, net, tu net tuition revenue per student. How does that then factor in AZP and ATA? Because those dollars on the revenue side do not necessarily uh, flow through net tuition. They flow through as an appropriation. So when we think about that, we need to be factoring in those state-funded financial aid dollars and, and, and because they do not come through on the revenue side that would be coming into net tuition. So all that to say, there's some really key things that we need to be thinking about when uh, we look at these measures. But just a few things to highlight from NAU. NAU exceeded $700 million for the first time in its history, um, which was, uh, again, you know, aided you know, certainly by some of the one-time funds. Uh, and to what Morgan just said, how do we plan for going forward as those one-time funds are used? We need to replace those and or manage the cost side uh, as well. NAU's net position uh, did increase about 32% over the past two years. Again, good trend. And underneath that trend, again, a good point that John uh, pointed out, the unrestricted portion. For the first time since 2015, when some of the GASB accounting uh, as, uh, entries uh, were required, NEU has had two consecutive years of positive unrestricted net position. Uh, so that was a really good, strong uh, indicator uh, of performance for NAU uh, over the past uh, couple years. Days, ca days cash on hand, you know, well within the ABOR approved range. Uh, I would also uh, point out uh, as we shift from more of the, you know, the balance sheet and the liquidity over to the uh, expenditure side, thinking about NAU, NAU's investment in people. We have made investments in people. We need to continue to make investments in people and salaries. That's probably one of the biggest challenges that we have going forward to uh, attract and retain individuals. That has an impact in terms of what we uh, see, and we have seen a positive trend on the uh, uh, ENG uh, per, per student. But that is something that we have to, uh, as Morgan said, what keeps you up at uh, night thinking about how we're going to continue to make those investments in people, which are really important uh, on that aspect. 
So let me just stop there, see if there's any questions, because I think this was really uh, you know, a good um, you know, overall uh, uh, discussion. Thank you. So uh, should we continue to look at the matrix? Um, you know, as all the university mentioned, the three universities, and including uh, the presentation that President Crow show about the in-state students, and that's where, you know, we have to put more um, re revenue to be able to offset, you know, the costs. So that that part of the in-state or the local student, I mean, that's the, the piece that I would like to see, you know, with our committee to to, to measure because that's where. Um, additional revenue have to come from because the state doesn't fund everything. So am I, am I, you know, I just want to make sure that we see that and how we can, you know, um, measure how we evolve with specific those students or those um, areas that we still have to put more financial aid, more revenue, and keeping enrollment. But it, as the in-state Enrollment grows, also the expenses grow. That, that's my input to that, and I would like to see, you know, some monitoring on, on that, because this is for the three universities, not just for, for one. I, I hope that makes sense. And Regent Mott, I'd just put the difference between in-state at the university versus in-state online, because it's a different model online for the in-state than it is when they're on campus. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, so we add that. Okay, good. Terrific discussion. Thank you all very much. Excuse me. Thank you. Okay, so let me just do a status on our, our afternoon. We've got eight items in 30 minutes. Um, <laughs> and I apologize for not moving us a little faster, but here we are. Um, the, and the next one is big. The next one is significant. So we're going to give it some time. But I want everybody to be mindful in their engagement that that we um, need to accelerate. I suspect the meeting is going to go long by probably 15 minutes, but I hope not more than that. So, because we, we can't rush through this, this is a very, very big deal. So, uh, the next item is a conversation about steps we're taking to ease a crisis caused by the trouble plagued rollout of the new federal FAFSA form. Uh, the Department of Education has not exactly met their deadlines, and all of us are at risk for paying the price for that. While the new version of the FAFSA form was supposed to simplify the process, the delays and computer glitches have resulted in a steep drop in the number of submissions nationally. The last several months have been challenging for students, families, and our financial aid teams who are understandably frustrated. We're here to better understand the form's rollout potential impact on our universities and what we're trying to do to ease the burden on Arizona families. As part of this item, the board will be asked to move the Arizona Promise Program prior deadline for FAFSA submissions from April 1st to May 1st. We'll now hear from Jane Kuhn and Julie Saints from the ABOR office on the impact this delay will have on our students and institutions. In addition, university enrollment leads Kent Hopkins from ASU, Annika Olson from NAU, Casey Gerquez from UA Arizona are here to answer any questions. Jane and Julie, over to you. Thank you, Chair Duvall and Regents. Um, this is a very important item that we wanted to um, bring to your attention. Um, and provide an update on. So I have asked, uh, Julie is our FAFSA specialist at the board, and she um, has done some yeoman's work in this area around trying to improve the number of FAFSA completions in light of the problems that we have experienced as a rollout of the FAFSA simplification process. Um, the universities as well, you'll hear from them, um, are very immersed in communications with students, parents, high school counselors, um, doing media splashes, doing videos, everything that they can to uh, improve this process. I am going to go ahead and turn it over to Julie so she can give you some background on what is happening. Thanks, Jane. Just to give you some background, uh, the whole FAFSA form was revamped this fall, so it was some work to revamp and expand PAL eligibility to more students. As part of the revamp, it was also meant to streamline the process so that it would be simpler for students to actually complete the form, since we know it's definitely a challenging one for students to do so. 
Um, with that PAL expansion, it was also supposed to increase PAL by 30 percent. Uh, 30, 000, additional 30,000 students would be eligible for the PAL grant, and an additional uh, 63,000 would be eligible for the max PAL grant. However, with this new revamp of the application, there were some delays. So with the delays, the form typically comes out in October. It was delayed and didn't actually come out until December 30th, which shortened that window of time where students would actually be able to complete the form. In addition to that, most recently, there was a delay with the FAFSA data. And this FAFSA data is data that our financial aid offices rely on to award students their federal packages for financial aid and also institutional aid as well. It's incorporated into that award letter. Um, so with that and the delays, um, on to the next slide. Um, with that and the delays come known issues with the FAFSA form. So although this form is supposed to be simplified to make it easy for students, there were technical glitches and there currently are technical glitches with the form that students are experiencing. Um, U.S. Department of Education has announced that 3.6 million students have successfully submitted the form. However, we know that there are millions of others who are having trouble actually accessing the form or completing it due to these technical glitches that are happening. Some of them have workarounds that federal student aid has posted um, that allow the student to successfully complete it. Others do not. Um, the frustrating part about it is that a lot of students are in a situation where there's currently no workarounds and there's no timelines provided by student aid, federal student aid as to when these will all be resolved. The most prevalent issues happening with the application are inviting contributors to the form. So that would be inviting a parent to the form so they can complete their portion or inviting a spouse. The other part is that contributors, um, students who have a social security number but their parents do not, they are currently right now in a limbo state where they're unable to complete the form at all. So that is a population of about eight to 10,000 Arizona high school seniors that are from mixed family status that are unable to complete this application due to this glitch. Uh, most recently on Tuesday, federal student aid did announce that this glitch would be fixed in mid-March. So we're uh, definitely excited about that. At least there's a timeline. Um, so definitely just trying to communicate that to students so that it's a waiting game right now and they'll be able to successfully complete it hopefully in the next few weeks. With that, also when students are directed to call the federal call center, there's long wait times, which just adds to that frustration. So with some preliminary data, we, we do have basically results to see exactly where Arizona is with FAFSA completion. So you'll see on the left-hand side, as of February 9th of last year, a little upwards of 29,000 seniors, these are all high school seniors, completed the application. February 9th of this year, a little over 15,000 seniors have completed the application, showing that we're actually down close to 45% compared to last year. On the right-hand side, you'll see that 15.7% of high school seniors have completed the form as of February 9th, and are actually ranked 49th in the nation. Knowing that this is a problem, national problem, Arizona is still ranked 49th, and you can see our, our company there um, that we have from 46 to 51st. On the next slide, uh, this just shares Arizona from Arizona and compared to national. So you'll see on the left hand side, it's showing that when they started tracking FAFSA completions, we definitely started off in a deficit um, and now we're at negative 45%. And then on the right hand side, you can see the national average is at 22.2%. And again, we're at 15.7, but that gap keeps widening every week, knowing that less Arizona students are actually completing the application compared to the national rate. And just for a little context, I, I looked at a couple of weeks of data and the end of June to the first week of February, there was about a 13.9% increase in FAFSA completions. That percentage, if we would have carried it out through the end of May, we would have gotten close to 30,000 uh, completed FAFSAs. However, the following week it dropped to an increase of only 6.5%. Um, so there's no real reliability in trying to predict where we might get by the end of this um, semester. Um, so you're probably wondering. Can I just ask a question? Yes, yes, please. yes absolutely. Is Arizona Sorry. Arizona a particularly dense Pell population relative to other states? 
So do we have, is our population yes. more densely eligible for Pell than most other states? So the impact of this failure of the DOE falls very heavily on our shoulders relative to other states. Uh, yes, it does. Um, and it's uh, the density of low income and diverse students, first generation students that are going to feel the impact of this the most. Okay. Thank you. So uh, you're probably wondering what does the, all of this mean by the information to the institutions and the FAFSA as well. As Julie mentioned, traditionally the application opens October 1st. It was delayed by three months um, this year. So they couldn't even go in to complete it until the beginning of January. ICERS, uh, that is the uh, institutional student record information that is sent from the department to the institution on those students that have chosen your institution as one to send their uh, FAFSA results to. Those typically would come in uh, late October, November. Uh, students could get awarded their uh, financial aid, get their financial aid notifications uh, mid-December. Uh, that now is delayed, the ICERs are delayed till mid-March, giving the institutions a little time to yep. test their systems and then begin awarding their packages and sending those notifications to students. So we are looking at potentially the beginning of April, uh, mid-April before students will receive their financial aid notifications. Uh, you've heard of the national candidate's decision date. That is May 1st uh, in Arizona at our institutions. That has really been a soft date. They all do accept students after that date. Uh, one of the things that the institutions have done is they have moved their uh, enrollment fee refund dates up, signaling to students that uh, they have more time to make some decisions. Um, and again, as, as I stated, um, th th this really impacts uh, the awards, a student's time to make a decision. Uh, many of our, our lower income students, students that are potentially a place bound or have family obligations, uh, making those decisions about where, what institution am I gonna go to uh, what kind of housing do I need to find? How much is this going to cost me? Is all going to be de delayed, which could uh, result in enrollment impacts at each of our institutions. And I have all the confidence in the world that they're looking very closely at this, how this may impact them. Uh, Julie, you want to? I, I've talked a little bit about with some of the things that we've done. We've extended the FAFSA priority submission dates at the institutions. Uh, we're asking the board to take action now to formally move the Arizona Promise priority FAFSA submission date up to May 1st so that they all match. Again, that date, like the national candidates' decision date, is a soft date. They can complete FAFSAs after that and have those sent to the institutions, and they will. Uh, complete award notifications to those students. What's, what's your level of confidence that DOE, who has already missed multiple deadlines, will make the next one? Uh, it, well, mine is, is zero. Not, not real great, although <laughs> they're, 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 you've probably heard they have called uh, for an investigation and, and many other things. I don't know that that is going to fix the problems. Uh, they do have significant software uh, issues around this and development issues around this. Okay. Um, I, I am absolutely mind boggled that our Department of Education, which is in charge of providing funds to low-income students to attend college actually put out a brand new system and a brand new form without running them side by side, without doing any sort of beta testing, and has failed the students and the families of this country miserably. This is 
absolutely unacceptable. And the fact that they've called for an investigation is going to do absolutely nothing. They, this Department of Education, has absolutely failed the public. And it was, un it was avoidable and easily avoidable. And that just, there's no excuse for that. Vision Goodyear. So we just heard presentations from John and Bjorn and Morgan on uh, the importance of enrollment dollars in running the institutions. I guess I'm looking to someone um, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10. What is this problem? Is it a 3, a 5? Uh, it seems to me like this is actually Any. somewhat yeah. dire. Uh, and so if it is, um, you know, is there anything we can do about it? I mean, other than delaying the deadlines, I mean, can we set up our own call center? Um, you know, if, if people are calling the federal uh, helpline and not getting the help that they need, I mean, we have three really can-do universities here. Um, what can we do to at least make the experience better for Arizonans? And again, if you tell me this is a five, okay, that's one thing. But if it's a seven or an eight on the alarm scale or a nine, what can we do? Yeah. Um, Regent Goodyear, okay. if I could just uh, ask Julie to go through some of the things that ABOR has done. Um, and uh, Julie and I did have a call with the governor's office, Aaron Hart. They have extended, uh, hopefully they can help. And the universities have been doing, as I said, yeoman's work around um, communicating and working with students and parents and high school uh, counselors. They've extended the number of events. But l let me let Julie go through at least what ABOR has done. Um, and uh, if Kent and Casey and Annika can go ahead and step up here, they can kind of give you some idea of what they have done as well. I don't, we don't know if this is a, a five or an eight. We have not received the information from the, from the Fed yet. Uh, uh, we don't know how many ICERs the institutions are going to get. Uh, we all hope that over the spring and summer, everything catches up and, uh, and we don't have any problems. Um, but uh, again, I think to, if we consider uh, the population of students that go to our institutions, they have some tough decisions to make. And this year, they have a much shorter period of time to make those decisions. I don't think the impact will be felt equally among the institutions. Obviously, ASU is in the valley. Students that want to go to go, go get their four-year degree that may have picked NAU or U of A may end up picking ASU because they don't have the opportunity to figure out housing and jobs, et cetera. So we don't know the impact, but I, I do think that this is a grave situation. So, Mr. Chair, Julie? Can, can I yes, just John. before Julie launches into mm -hmm. that, and, and you know, you know, uh, Jane introduced Julie as, as the as the board's FAFSA expert. I just suggest Julie is the state's FAFSA yeah. expert. She she's been working on this issue for years and knows more about it than anybody. But but the other piece of this is that it's incredibly frustrating. Is is the board invested millions of dollars over the last two years to change the trajectory of of FAFSA completion in the state, which has been very low. We've ranked in the bottom of the United States for the last decades. Mm -hmm. And finally, <laughs> last year, you know, largely through the efforts of Julie and this board and the and our partners, which we have many, we, we saw a turn and started seeing an increase in, in the number of, of FAFSAs completed in our state. I think we were top 10 last year in, in improvement. Correct. And uh, and the U.S. DOE has just destroyed all of those efforts. I mean, millions of dollars that we spent to address this particular issue. And as noted, it's going to impact our, our first-time students, first- and family students, perhaps more than anybody, that, that this department could not figure out how to address 
a student whose parents don't have a social security number. And that, and we've talked about how Arizona is a high Pell state, but we may be the highest state in that particular situation. And these aren't students likely to return. They come to the gates once, and if they're turned away, many of them will never come back. Yeah, these are students that have done everything right. They're yes. at-risk students. They make their way through high school. They do everything that's correct, and now the West DOE is blocking them from yeah. moving on. Dr. Crow had his hand up. Yeah, okay. I, I, just, I just wanted to say that, you know, we encountered, you know, global pandemics. You know, we, you know we'll, we'll certainly get through a computer glitch in the Department of Education by taking it and using it to our advantage. And so there are ways to use it to our advantage. It doesn't mean that it all works out. I mean, our team under uh, Kent is, is doing a lot of things, and eventually we'll get to the, to the individual responses. But, but, you know, we look at this as something that's like a, uh, uh, a, a massive thunderstorm delivering water to a desert parched area that came <laughs> on the wrong day. So you still have the water, meaning you, I mean, you got to adjust to what's going on. And so there are ways by messaging, by reacting, by using the energy of the negative outcome to work that to your advantage. And so we intend to see no reduction in enrollment, no reduction whatsoever, including using whatever tool is necessary to attract the students, get the students to make the decision. And so you'll hear from our team. I'm just letting you know that, yes, it's all bad, but like too bad, it's already done. And so either we're, we're you mm -hmm. know, all we should be talking about is what we're doing, yeah. not what yeah. happened, mm -hmm. because it's done. Yeah. <laughs> so, Julie, go ahead. Yeah, Julie. Um, so as far as ABOR actions, what we've been doing, really preparing for this new FAFSA application form. So that's working with school counselors at the start of the beginning of the school year to talk about all the changes happening with the form, how to support students. As John me mentioned, we also have invested in Arizona College Connect, which is our statewide um, system that allows authorized high schools and districts to access their student level FAFSA data to help students through the application process staying in communication with students. Also, we have statewide support. So we have a FAFSA hotline that is statewide in partnership with one of our, um, actually be a leader in ASU. Um, and then we also have Ask Benji, which is our statewide chat bot, in addition to virtual appointments that we offer to students as well to help them complete the form. Um, we also lead Arizona's FAFSA coalition, which is um, all of our institutions, community colleges, and college access partners statewide to come together and convene to help elevate the message of FAFSA. So really leveraging that, um, and then obviously advocating for FAFSA resolutions. So really trying to be that advocate for Arizona to resolve resolutions with the FAFSA form with federal student aid. Um, the other thing that we have been doing is also to develop a marketing campaign. So this marketing campaign, I'm on the next slide, is, oh, it's okay. <laughs> the marketing campaign is really to elevate the message of FAFSA, elevate the statewide resources, and let students know that our universities have moved their FAFSA priority dates, but we'll work with students beyond those dates, um, given the circumstances with the application. Um, we've also debuted, oh, it's back up again. <laughs> uh, we've also debuted and launched a new website on College Ready AZ that has all the statewide resources available. Um, our universities have also implemented new workshops, online hours, virtual hours to help support students. So those are all posted. And then we have all the FAFSA issues and workarounds posted on there as well. And then as Jane mentioned, working with the governor's office to really um, elevate that message at a statewide level and promote all of our uh, FAFSA resources that we have available to ensure that students have the support throughout the remainder of the spring semester and then also in the summer, which is going to be a really, I think, crucial time to make sure that students follow through once all of these resolutions are implemented in the form. Good. Julie, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Regent Pacheco, can you hear me? I can. Thank you so much for um, allowing me to make a comment. Uh, remotely. I am um, I am really concerned about this and I really appreciate how um, Regent Pacheco, we've I've lost heard you. where these are potentially um, first time. Can you can you hear me now? In and out. Give, give Hello? it a shot. Keep going. Yeah, We're I, I coming apologize. in intermittently. So I um I, I just 
Okay, um, very concerned. Thank you for all of the efforts. Um, I would like to make sure that we have an update on this um, at our next meeting and want to make sure that we're um, doing all we can to help Arizona families. And I mean, it just is, this is completely ridiculous. I mean, it's, I cannot believe they can't set up a system to have people apply for the help that they need. It's just really, really unfortunate. Thank you. Thank you, Regent. Okay, I know we could really go with this for a while. We've got about 10 minutes left in our meeting and four more items. Um, let's do a wrap up and then per uh, Regent Pacheco's comment, we're gonna schedule more time at our next meeting. I would just ask each of the universities to do a 30 second synopsis of what okay. you're doing. And yep. I, I do Thank have you. lists from them that I can uh, get out to you. Kent? Kent, start with you. Uh, as President Crow said, we have to look at the same situation in a similar vein to what we faced with COVID. And we have to be vigilant, but we also have to show confidence to our public that we are going to work with them. And so in the past three or four cycles, students could apply for financial aid in October. They couldn't this year. And then out went a technologically glitched FAFSA but that didn't stop the demand of our admitted students from Arizona. We have close to 16,000 Arizonans who've already been admitted. And we're working with them on a daily basis to get them to the next step. It's just a different step. So I, I just be mindful that we've got a role in, in, in lowering the anxiety of our families. We are not going anywhere. We're going to work with them through this process. And guess what? It may be late, but it's still going to work. We'll wait until mid-March. That's when we get the first files from the federal government. But families already have received information from the federal government that shows that they're Pell eligible. So we're working with our families to say, look at what the federal government has sent you. You're Pell eligible. In our case, you've applied for the Obama program. You've met all assured admission. You're in line to be Obama eligible. It's just a different way of thinking. And, and We've been at this since August of this year, knowing that at some point, we were concerned because you never heard anything from the federal government, never heard anything. And Soft launch, it didn't work. <laughs> so so, I'll, so. I'll, just, I'll just add then, that means then we can with very significantly capable uh, analytics, we know who's gonna be eligible for what. They'll just be admitted and we'll be telling them what they're gonna be getting. And then if it doesn't work out later, then we'll make it work one way or another because eventually this money is coming and the yes. extent to which that will be inaccurate will be low. So we'll just cover that. And while all the other institutions out there are running around with their hair on fire, we're going to get some of those kids. I'm not talking about our sister institutions. I'm talking about any other states. So they get their hair on fire running around. Well, come on down because we're working it out. Good. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Casey? Sure. Uh, very quickly, similar to what Kent said, I think that our, our biggest focus right now is helping to get more FAFSA completers because, as you saw, there's uh, many students who and families who have not completed the FAFSA. We're down very much compared to where we should be right now, even though we're not on equal exact footing of when the FAFSA opened. So that is a huge focus of us. Um, I think all of us have our net price calculators updated. So as students are playing on our sites, they can see exactly what they might be eligible for as well. So we're very focused on that. and. Also, we're up in our resident applications, close to 13,000 admitted residents. And so I think that's a good showing that students want to be with us. And we're staying in really just direct communication with them about what their aid may look like, as well as um, what they need to do next to. We're, we're all on it. <laughs> we are. We have been anticipating delays for months and months and has been a central focus of our um, conversations amongst ourselves. And to, to the same point, we are messaging all the time to our students. For us, the A2E message has been really helpful using that income-based threshold instead of the Pell-based threshold. So we're leaning into that um, more than ever. Um, also, I think all of us do an amazing job communicating and providing parent and family information 
I think all of us have a parent portal. Um, ours, everything that goes out is in both English and Spanish for us. We had a very successful event last night on campus for all of Flagstaff and current students. And those things will continue. To Casey's point, I cannot echo enough. Students are now afraid to fill out the FAFSA. We also have had students call us and say, I think I did it wrong. It only took me 10 minutes. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> getting students to the form with family members is critical at this juncture for all of us. Mm -hmm. So we can be as fast as we can once we get the patches to our SISs to get the information into students and families' hands. Yep. Very good. All right. More to come. The board will be announcing more steps. I know more steps will be coming out of the universities, and we'll give everybody a prize. We need you to vote. Oh, yes, we do. <laughs> yes, Thank we do. There, there is one thing we can do immediately <laughs> to assist this effort. This is the why we formality. have talking points. Yeah. <laughs> so we need to move the priority deadline for Arizona Promise students from April to May 1st. Yep. Therefore, I move that the board approve moving the Arizona Promise program priority deadline for FAFSA submissions from April 1st from to May 1st. Uh, 2024. Do I have a second? Second. Moved and seconded. All those say in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you all very much. All right. Next on the agenda is the multi-year employment contract for Vice President of Athletics and Director of Athletics. President Robbins, I know you've been looking forward to this moment. It is yours. Thank you, Chair Duvall, and you foreshadowed a lot of uh, what I was going to say, so I'll keep it brief since I know the hour is late. We are very fortunate that Desiree Reed Francois is bringing her talents back to the University of Arizona in Tucson. She's a national leader in athletics, uh, having uh, been an undergrad uh, student athlete at UCLA and then earning her law degree at, at the U of A. Uh, she went on to serve as uh, Deputy Athletic Director at the University of Tennessee and Virginia Tech before becoming the Athletic Director at UNLV and currently has served for the last three years as the Athletic Director at the University of Missouri. Uh, that is in the SEC. She is the only of the, 16, or of the 15 public universities, she is the first woman to serve as an athletic director at a public institution in the SEC, and she's one of only four sitting Power Five women ADs and the only Latina. Uh, you have all the details of her contract. We are very, very excited about her coming. Uh, she has turned around athletic departments at UNLV and the University of Michigan, uh, Missouri, and we are confident that she will help us uh, get our athletic uh, department not only back to uh, financial sustainability, but also change the whole culture of our athletic department. We are on a um, incredible rise uh, with our athletic success, and she is going to just uh, amplify and uh, turbocharge that effort. So I am very thrilled to present her for your consideration. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, comments, questions from board members? Well done. Exactly. Yes, indeed. Okay. So um, I move that the board approve the multi-year employment contract for Desiree Reed Francois as Vice President and Director of Athletics at the University of Arizona, as described in the executive summary. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries. Moving to our next item, the board is asked to review and approve the second amended multi-year employment agreement for men's basketball head coach. President Robbins, back to you. So Tommy Lloyd is in his third season at the U of A. Uh, during his first season, he was voted the uh, coach of the year in college basketball. Um, I saw on the ticker on ESPN uh, last night that he has compiled a record of uh, 81 and 15, I believe. An incredible winning percentage. He's uh, he's built an incredible uh, uh, culture around the men's uh, basketball program. Currently uh, ranked in the top five. I'm assuming going to be in the top three after uh, losses from Purdue and Connecticut recently. Uh, and it sets up very nicely. If he stays as a number one seed, he would play his first round games in Salt Lake City, then L.A. And if it all works out well, would return to Phoenix for the Final Four. So I'm not putting any pressure on Coach Lloyd. But, right. Uh, it, it's a it's a uh, 
Charming it's just, existence. Well, no, it's a it's a made for TV movie right there. So, um, <laughs> Coach Lloyd has uh, he has been mentioned in many high profile uh, jobs at other institutions, and we're incredibly appreciative uh, to the board for supporting this contract extension. And as you outlined, uh, Chair Duvall, uh, not only for Coach Lloyd. Uh, but also for any increases that we had over the previous athletic director, all of those funds were raised from private donations to cover any of these costs. And I, as you said, I, I'll echo, we're just incredibly grateful to our generous donors who love the U of A and, and provided this support. That's it. Great. Comments, questions? Okay, hearing none, I move the board approve the second amended multiple year contract, employment contract for Tommy Lloyd as men's basketball head coach at the University of Arizona as described in the executive summary. Do I have a second? Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone mm -hmm. opposed? Motion carries. For our next item, the board is asked to elect a board secretary. Jennifer Pollack will present this item. Jennifer. Thank you, Chair Deval. Members of the board, uh, as you know, the board secretary position um, has become vacant uh, with Regent Herbold's <clears throat> departure. Uh, he served as board secretary for this term, so the board office is asking the board to elect Regent Brewster to serve as board secretary through June 30th, 2024. Okay. Any comments, questions, pushback, opposition? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I move that the board elect Greg Brewster to serve as board secretary through June 30th, 2024. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you and congratulations, Regent. <laughs> By acclamation. Thank you. Our next item is the report of the, 20, of the January 25th, 2024 Strategic Initiatives and Planning Committee meeting. Regent Manson is chair of the committee. Would you please address this matter? Thank you. I will make this short and sweet. Um, during the uh, committee meeting, we spoke with our health care consultants, Dr. Jackie Chadwick and, Doc and Ms. Judy Gurness, on Arizona's long-term health care needs and the university's Healthy Tomorrow initiatives. Um, we focused on kind of the major issues that needed to be addressed to make Healthy Tomorrow's a success. Um, frankly, it's clear that there's a lot of work to be done around clinical training site capacity, the financial model to support all of this, and navigating the accreditation requirements and the expansion of graduate medical education. So we look forward to having the two of those consultants back on a regular basis to kind of give us an update on the progress that's been made. Um, we also had updates from Dr. Shereen Gabriel, Provost Gonzalez, Dr. Julianne Baldwin, and Provost Pugliese on ASU and NAU's progress toward establishing their medical schools. Um, progress has been made, and we are looking forward to hearing more in the coming months from each university. That's all. Well said. Thank you, Madam Chair. Moving to our next item, Regent Mata is chair of the University Governance and Operations Committee. Would you please provide your report? Yes. Thank you, Sharon Duvall. I would like to give a report on the last University Governance and Operations Committee. We had an impactful meeting with much uh, important business being done. So we first started with ASU proposed new medical school with two new degrees programs, which the committee recommended that the board approve. The committee then received a presentation on the board's new report on operational efficiency efficiency metrics. Regent Herbal worked hard on these metrics with Brad and the university's CFOs, so I look forward to receiving this data often. We want to thank Regent Herbal for all the work that he put behind, you know, this, this group. The committee also took up the University of Arizona request to sell three properties, two in Tucson and one in Douglas. Selling these properties was good for the university and the community. The committee also discussed legislation with Thomas Atkins, and as you her today, we are watching some of the bills closely. We always want to work with the governor and legislatures to improve Arizona. The board also um, is working to provide more financial oversight over the university. Part of the process is reviewing and strengthening our budget and financial operations policies. The committee review our financial policies and the new and revised policies are on today's, it was on today's uh, board agendas on first reading. We also forwarded two policies revision related to fees and the settlements of claims. Finally, we move forward NAU's academic programs and financing, uh, financing for an ASU project. As you can see, the committee had a busy meeting, and we look forward to our next meeting in April. This concludes our University Governance and Operations Committee portion of the meeting. If, if get, I get approved, I can call it the Ugo Committee. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Appreciate it. All right, we'll now move to the student regents report. Regents Reese and Zaragoza, please proceed. Thank you, Chair Duvall, and thank you to ASU for hosting us. I'm sorry I can't be there in person today for this board meeting. Hearing about all of the exciting initiatives and the great innovation being spearheaded by ASU is encouraging and reinvigorates both Regent Zaragoza and myself as we continue our own degrees and our responsibilities as student regents. This path, past month, I had the opportunity to meet and collaborate with student leadership at the University of Arizona. I greatly valued and appreciated the time spent discussing the priorities, initiatives, and concerns of students. I was especially impacted by the great work students are leading in the Basic Needs Center. I want to continue to promote these resources and bolster them with the help of the board and the University of Arizona. Providing support for the basic needs of students is always a priority, and I look forward to working alongside student leaders to make these resources even more robust and accessible. I will now pass the mic to Regent Zaragoza. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Reese. Uh, today, I'd like to inform the audience about new initiatives I will be undertaking during the rest of my term on the board, both in my role as student regent and as the new owner of Michael Crow's Ten Rings. So, <laughs> <laughs> I have to get the names straight, though. Not too long ago, I had a great conversation with Chair DeVal about how to expand the board's media reach among students. And he and I noted that as effective as press releases are at uh, communicating with legislators and university administrators, they often don't resonate with our student bodies. So to address this over the next few months, I will be working with the board office uh, to create new media that can quickly and directly speak to our student bodies regarding the programs and initiatives the board is undertaking starting tonight with a recap of today's meeting. I look forward to updating the board and the public on these efforts. And uh, I also want to say I took the time to invite ASU student leadership to attend our meeting, and I'm very thankful that they and their staff are here with us in the audience today. Um, let me be clear in saying that these five student body presidents and their staff are incredibly capable people and that I'm so honored to work alongside them. Um, today, I, I also would like to strongly encourage the board to continue investing time and resources in College Ready AZ uh, in the years to come. Over the past few weeks, I've become more familiar with the strategies and processes of this program, and I'm astounded at how quickly it has yielded really positive results. I've known a lot of students, um, both in high school and in college, who would benefit from College Ready, and I'm sure that there are many more to come and that the positive results it has yielded in such a short time speak to its potential to impact the lives of Arizona students for the better. Regent Reese and I thank the board and the audience for lending an ear to our matters and look forward to updating everyone on the efficacy of our initiatives. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. Appreciate it very much. Our final item today is a report from the Arizona Faculties Council and Professor Dolan. Okay. Over to you. Put my New York Fast Minute voice on. <laughs> okay. um, the faculty of the three universities again welcome this opportunity to meet with the regents and share positive developments and concerns as well. On the positive side, the U.S. Department of State awarded a $13.8 million cooperative agreement to ASU under the International Technology Security and Innovation Fund, aimed at bolstering the assembly, testing, and packaging capabilities in ITSI partner countries in the Americas and the Indo-Pacific. This part of the CHIPS Act mirrors the central themes of the charter that guides Arizona State University in that it strives to build a resilient international supply chain. The University of Arizona has been awarded a prestigious Delphi Award for their case studies in 2023, which highlights innovative and important policies, programs, and initiatives instituted by these universities uh, in support of their career track faculty. The faculty is proud of all of our colleagues, but we want to acknowledge the excellence of the UA colleague, one of two in the US, that was inducted into the Inventors Hall of Fame. NAU is projected to achieve R1 research status in 2025 and has seen an increase of over 40% in the fall 2023 first year cohort of indigenous students. NAU researchers have explained the, remar have explained the remarkable recovery of the coastal redwoods forest following the CZU lightning complex fire which burned thousands of acres in August 2023. As always, freedom of speech remains an important topic for all universities. This year marks the 60th anniversary of the free speech movement 
that began among students at the University of California, Berkeley, and spread swiftly across the country. We believe free speech must be protected. As mentioned in an article in the New York Times Magazine, quote, the classroom is first and foremost a place to train young minds toward a yearning for knowledge and a taste for argument, to be intellectually curious, even if what they wind up discovering challenges their most cherished convictions. We cannot support policies that restrict academic freedom and prevent certain topics from being taught. Quote, the development of science and of the creative activities of the spirit requires a freedom that consists in the independence of thought from the restrictions of authoritarian and social prejudice, nod to Albert Einstein. Nurturing that should be the fundamental role of government, he felt, and the mission of education. A bill currently being considered in the Arizona House of Representatives uh, proposes to alter the role of faculty in the nature of governance at Arizona's three universities. We would like to address these changes currently being proposed in the legislature that would change the faculty's role from participants to consultants in shared governance, personnel, and education matters, centralizing power with the university president and the Arizona Board of Regents. Nearly all universities in the nation operate according to a standard of shared governance. The term shared governance is used in uh, universities and can mean different things to different constituents. In its simplest definition, is it a decision making that incorporates input from the governing board and administration, president and leadership, and the faculty. It should be a transparent process where all parties have a measure of influence on matters affecting the university. According to an article in the Association of Governing Boards, the board's responsibilities fiduciary and supervisory, and the primary responsibility for faculty is the curriculum. Shared governance is a way of protecting the educational mission of a university from the restrictive and narrow viewpoint that might be held by a board or a specific individual. This collaborative approach of shared governance is highly valued for several reasons, as it aims to leverage the diverse expertise and perspectives within the university community to make informed and effective decisions. There are many benefits of shared governance in a university, among them institutional integrity and stability, adaptability, innovation, transparency, and trust. For example, all three university faculties worked in concert with university administrations to successfully navigate and pass new general education programs. The Arizona Faculties Council, which represents the shared views of mutual concerns of all three university faculties, understands that our three universities do not operate in lockstep and each have their own perspective and Senate structures. We are not a monolith. The actions or positions of the faculty of one university do not necessarily represent those of the other universities. We know we are at a somewhat pivotal moment as regards our shared governance model and hope for a practical and positive resolution. Like democracy, shared governance is not always neat and tidy but it represents the surest way to guarantee the best outcomes for our students and the people and the state of Arizona. We profoundly appreciate the board's support and look forward to continuing to work constructively together. I was going to ask if there were any questions or comments, <laughs> but I, if there's time, if there are any questions sure. or comments. Anybody want to ask a question or make a comment? Well, that's something that was an elegant statement. Well said. We are really grateful for the quality of shared governance and it works well and it does in many cases if not all and mm -hmm. want to thank you for your leadership in, in pursuing that thank you anyone else okay this concludes today's public meeting uh, a couple of announcements those who are attending the asu regions professor ceremony it's being held in the vantana ballroom the faculty breakfast is at 7 30 tomorrow morning in the coaches oh did you okay no we didn't <laughs> Look at, looking forward oh, to that videotape. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Following the faculty breakfast, the board is scheduled to reconvene an executive session for a review of assignments with President Cruz Rivera and President Crow and other items on the executive session agenda. The board will adjourn following executive session. I'd like to thank President Crow and the staff, Director Arnold, Chad Sampson, and the board staff for all of their work on this meeting. And the board is now in recess. <laughs>